Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. And welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits. And by now, of course, you will have heard of the terribly sad news of the passing of Stephen Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim, of course, being one of the legendary names of musical theatre. And who sits alongside Jerome Kern and Rodgers and Hammerstein as one of the architects of the three main periods of innovation of 20th century musical theatre. Now, for many years, Stephen Sondheim has been the grand old man of musical theatre, and more recently of musical film, as many of his great classic stage productions have been adapted into films, with a greater or lesser degree of success, but perhaps that's a discussion for another day. Today, and over the next few episodes of Musical Talk, we're going to be paying tribute to Stephen, and it's entirely right that we do. His legacy, I think, will live on, and we'll be discussing what that legacy might be in the new year. But it's almost true to say that Stephen Sondheim's career, life, legacy and collection of works stand beyond words. But of course that's also not true. Because here on Musical Talk, we're going to be using words, it's all we have, we're an audio podcast, to pay tribute to Sondheim in, I hope, a fitting way. Now, Musical Talk has been in existence now for 15 years, and as you can imagine, discussions on pretty much every part of Stephen Sondheim's life and career have been discussed at some point in episodes across that period. And so we have an enormous Sondheim archive. So, for this episode and the next one, I've taken a random selection of interesting conversations about some aspect of Stephen Sondheim's work and simply strung them together. And, in so doing, I think that illustrates the breadth of the man's talent and indeed legend. And then, in the episodes after that, we'll hear in full two conversations I had where we analysed the work of Stephen Sondheim. But taking us back to this episode... Let's begin the tributes to Stephen Sondheim with this collection of archive recordings. And we start with a conversation about passion with two friends of Musical Talk, Andrew Keating and Eve Herkman. Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Eve, it's wonderful to speak to you both, and thank you for joining me here for this, the third part of our discussion about Stephen Sondheim here on Musical Talk. Now, we, between the three of us, sometimes together and sometimes apart, have seen quite a lot of Sondheim this year, Mm -hmm. because there's been quite a lot of Sondheim to see. But let's start with Passion. You all saw Passion at the Donmar Warehouse. Yes. As did you, first. I did. Mm. Yes. Now, question, what was your view of Passion before you went in? And then what did you think of this production? I guess I've always loved the music. Uh, I remember obviously getting the CD first uh, back in the 90s. I think it was 94 or 95 when the CD was released. The British or the American? The American version. And I absolutely loved the music. I guess it was the first time that I heard a Sondheim show where the lyrics were not as witty as I was used to. Mm. But um, I absolutely loved the music. It was just so intense. And I also found it quite easy to, to follow the story. And that's not always the case with Sondheim musicals. There's a lot of them where you can listen to the music and you can listen to the recording and at the time I was living in Belgium so you don't get to see shows but this one was actually quite easy to follow and I did see the production with Michael Ball and Maria Friedman in mm. 1996 I think it was and it left me a bit lukewarm if I'm uh, if I'm honest so I 
I guess I was a bit tentative in going to see this version and I have to say I absolutely adored it. I tried to see it again but it was sold out but I thought it was brilliant. And didn't you go and try and see it at the Bridewell as well? Did we both see the Bridewell version oh, that's a couple true. of years back? <laughs> Actually, yeah, Three I forgot about that. Ago? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think that was a semi-professional production. That's the it yeah. was, and you know, I can't remember it very well, which no. I guess says something about story, it. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I liked it. I actually liked it. I think it's one of the stories that I do like. Uh, although my only issue would be that I'm not sure that I agree with his reading of it. Right, so when, when I've heard him speak about the show, he wants you to believe and to accept that the relationship with Fosca and Giorgio is a real relationship by the end. That He genuinely really does love her. It's kind of moved from pity to actual passion. And I'm just not sure. I just don't see it that way. I don't think I like the story that way. I prefer it as a story about obsession. You know, and, and I like Fosca as what this almost kind of... It, it, sometimes she's almost like a pantomime villain. I think more so if you listen to how Maria Friedman does it. It's something about the voice, you know. Yeah, I think, Georgia. I, would agree. <laughs> I, think yeah, I would agree with that. Mm. It's very much about obsession rather than passion, I would say. I do think... It has some romantic themes in it, and actually the opening song is probably one of the few very romantic songs that Sondheim has ever written, and it's very, it's very beautiful. And I guess the theme that keeps coming back is, I never knew what love was until this moment. And then, you know, as he meets Fosca and, gets, and she gets obsessed with him, and he gets very confused about his feeling, then he thinks again, I never knew what love was, because I think he repeats it at that stage. So, but I agree, I think it's more about obsession and I also think it's difficult to believe that he actually would fall for her. I think he just becomes very confused. I mean you've already raised a very interesting issue which is actually how true and we've discussed this before actually off the microphone how true is the relationship and I use the word relationship in speech marks. Now I've got my own take on this is which is that has always been the sore point of this particular musical for me which is I fundamentally don't believe the central relationship because I don't believe anyone ever falls in love with their stalker, which is essentially what the story is. So, What about Patty Hearst? Stockholm Syndrome, slightly different. Well, stalker, yeah, that's a different thing again, because you actually still have liberty with the stalker. You can run away. I wonder if Georgia falls in love with the idea of having somebody who loves them that much rather than with the person of Fosca. Isn't that just vanity? Isn't that, I mean, how, how vain is Giorgio? Here's an interesting question, because he clearly... How shall I put this? His first relationship is with Clara, and she, mm-hmm. you know, her name is, is light, and you know, uh, and she's bouncy, and she's always attractive, and she's always blonde, and she's always everything that's sort of textbook beautiful, and therefore they make a beautiful couple. So even then, you can read that as he's basking in the adoration of how they might look if they were seen in public. And now with Fosca, he's got a totally uh, whose name means dark, mm-hmm. got a totally different relationship, but it's still about the fact that he's being put on a pedestal. And I suppose with Fosca. It's do you read her love as being unconditional or not? Because some people say, yes, it is. I err towards, well, it's not really. She still has expectations of him, the same as Clara does. They're Mm -hmm. different expectations. It's just kind of the ferocity of how much she likes him. And he just seems to be mixing that with pity, pity for her. He could go, he could leave it, but he chooses not to. He chooses to, like a soldier, do his duty. Hmm. And he does, almost literally at the end, of course. I guess the turning point is when she becomes more human in, in the play, and I believe that Sondheim wrote Loving You specifically for that reason, to make her more of a sympathetic figure. And I think that really works, because up until that moment, she's both for the audience and, I guess, for Giorgio, a very irritating, just very irritating woman, and it's really difficult to sympathise with her. And I guess when she sings Loving You, which I actually find a very, very moving song, it's very... well deceptively simple I guess and the lyrics are very simple but very effective I think that's a bit of a turning point and I think that's the point where he probably sees her more as human than than he ever did before and I think that's where the change occurs in him and where when he starts to get confused but do you think that he ever resolves that confusion no I don't think he does and do you no I don't think so I mean I think one of the things I liked in in this performance in the Donmar production is where Giorgio starts picking up little ticks and mannerisms in the physical performance, so you can see his kind of inter- his internal breakdown, his turmoil, is is <laughs> externalised, you know, for, and that's what's happening to him. You know, he's breaking yeah. down. And you can see it, which again kind of adds weight to that fact, to the idea that this isn't really a genuine relationship, because if it was, 
why would he be transformed in what seems to be quite a negative way? It's yet another Stephen Sondheim musical that ends with one of the central characters having a nervous breakdown. Very literally, he has a physical and nervous breakdown at yes. the end, doesn't he? I mean, he loses in a duel yes. um, and ends up in sort of in clink, and you know, he's, he's he's not having a happy time of it at the end. I mean, interestingly, where we that we also went to, I think even I separately didn't we? We went to Sundime in conversation. Yes, we did. Yes, here and at the uh, sorry at the National Theatre. At the National Theatre, I also was there. Were you also there, yes. Thos? The, the the platform. Yes. Yes. So we are oh, okay. Interestingly, at that, he was asked about the theme of relationships. He was shying away and distancing himself from autobiographical readings of the show. Of all shows. Of all shows. And he does that in Sondheim on Sondheim as well. His new book. Yeah. Um, in, in the show. Oh, right. Sondheim on Sondheim. Yeah. yeah, when you listen to the cast recording and you hear him talking about it, he really distances himself of uh, any autobiographical elements yeah. in his show. So, except for Sunday in the Park with George, actually. But put it this way. I mean, he's 100 years old and he's his own grandson. <laughs> See. I think it's the life of an artist. <laughs> But if you put it this way, you know, if he wants you to believe that that's a genuine love relationship, if that's his intention, which he said on various occasions it is, I'm sorry, that says something about you and your view of relationships. If that's what love and passion is for you, that's not a healthy relationship. That's an odd relationship. That must reflect, that cannot not reflect the author. It has to (laughs) be him in there. Although the story is not his story at the end no. of the day, it is based on, on a novel from the 19th century. And, beginning and of the 19th century. Yes. Yeah. And, and is it, is it beginning? Certainly in the middle, anyway. Yeah. Uni- unification of Italy is the context, isn't it? So that's 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. But, but Could well be. <laughs> but having said that, I mean, even though you must be attracted to stories for particular reasons, there must be certain things about that you pick this story rather than that story and why and you can look at you can look at his work and find themes and to kind of say well we can find themes but they don't relate to the to the person that's writing them seems odd it seems slightly you know contrary to say well well I'm just I, you know I'm, I'm, and he kind of also said in that speech you know I'm a romantic writer are you a romantic writer with a lot of kind of relationship breakdowns and I don't think he is a yeah. romantic writer at all and I think that's what appeals to so many people actually mm. it appeals to me that he's an intellectual yes. writer and that I can go and see a Sondheim musical and no I'm not going to get A too much dancing because dance really doesn't speak to me and B I'm not going to get too much sentimentality which is often confused for love in other musicals uh, and so it is a fact that I like the fact he's head first and heart third <laughs> I think he's attracted to showing the complexity of relationships and I think uh, as an audience member I'm attracted to go and see that and uh, I guess it's less, less boring than just seeing a romantic relationship blossom yeah. and, and there's not much story to that, what he shows and I guess it's the same with, uh, you are mentioning people having breakdowns in his shows and I know you've, you've mentioned this before but what I think he's attracted by is showing people at a point at turning points in their lives and I think all of us at some point or other go through mini breakdowns yeah. or, or mini stages in our life where we Nexus make points. changes. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think, and that makes for an interesting story and that makes you reflect uh, as somebody who goes to the theatre, it makes you think. It's a journey though, isn't it? I mean, all characters in a, in a well-written play or a well-written musical have a journey and yes. of course a journey is facilitated by doing something different if you don't do anything at all. So I think you're yep. right. Whether these resolve is another matter because quite often the nervous breakdowns end the piece I and mean, you don't actually see the result you see the build up to the nervous breakdown certainly in Follies for example you yes know, he gets, I agree he's, he gets picked up by his wife who then says right time to go home and they do and that's that and you don't know how that's going Which to resolve it's bizarre it's just so bizarre I don't really love myself well you've had 20 years of therapy if yeah. that hasn't worked nothing is your wife going home with you at the end is not going to work. And, and that's, that's the letdown of Follies. Yes, yes, it is, actually. You know, is that it doesn't ending? resolve. It doesn't resolve. It's a bit like, oh, how are we going to end this? We can't end this. Yeah. It's, it's a bit like... Um, it's the equivalent of waking up and going, it was all a dream. <laughs> oh, I didn't really love him. He wasn't the man I thought he was all along. Actually, I do love my husband. So, can I... But I, I, This is really interesting. And it's something you just touched upon earlier as well fascinates me. Sometime in his public utterances, particularly in his older age, mm. is about pushing back any connection between his work and himself. He's trying desperately to say, look, I am different to what you're seeing. I'm a different individual. All I'm doing is mimicking what the authors and the storyline requires of me, which I think most of us don't buy. There are several things about his... The first significant biography of Sondheim, rather than Sondheim's works, 
was only a few years ago. Yeah. Most people didn't know he was a gay man until a few years mm -hmm. ago. He's been very good at protecting who he is. Do we not think that these public utterances now are just more of the same? They are distance. I mean, this idea that he's not involved in the development of the characterisation and, until he's presented with the book is just, to me, nonsense, because he's at all the workshops. He's clearly, as you say, picking up the bits and pieces he does. So, is the voice that we hear in a Sondheim musical actually who Stephen Sondheim is? Or is he who he thinks the characters are? That's an open question, and you may discuss. <laughs> it depends whether... I suppose it depends on your take on kind of auteur theory. You know, that they are thought of as Sondheim shows. You don't kind of think of who's written the book. Yeah. Hooray, it's now, a James Lapine it story. Absolutely, absolutely. You might be able to spot patterns in the book writing, but you don't think of that. You know, you think of, they are his shows. Even, even if you kind of take star performances away, the director away, everything else, they're thought of as being Sondheim shows. And it just seems... I'm not sure odd. that is right, though. I, I think you're right, but I, I'm not sure that's the right thing to be to be looking at in a way because he always stresses that he's a collaborator. He collaborates with other people, and without him or without his collaborators, the show wouldn't exist. And I truly believe that. I think he he always says, "I would not be able to write a song unless you give me a theme, or you give me a situation, and I'll write a song about that." And I truly believe that. I do think that he goes for those subject matters that he can relate to very much and that he goes for those characters that he can relate to and I do think like every author does uh, I think <laughs> I'm not an author myself obviously but as every author does you put a lot of yourself in, in what you write well I wrote a play called Dracula so I'm not sure I agree with that <laughs> okay <laughs> but can I read it sometime <laughs> <laughs> it is online ladies and gentlemen <laughs> reasonable rates um, no but uh, mm, that I tell you why I think that's once again sometime being slightly disingenuous because it's it's true that unless there is some material to write a song about you don't have a song and he's just saying he's not the creator of the original material but he is the creator of the journey in a lot of cases mm. certainly within the song if not in the whole piece and also as you quite rightly said Eve, um, he clearly picks stories that he that relate to him mm. for example Bounce would not have been turned into a musical if he had fallen in love with the story of the Meisners, hmm. the Meisner brothers. And he's been trying to push that story for 30, 40 years. God knows and, why. And, and yeah, but everybody knows that is sometimes baby. Mm. Yeah. It's not any of his um, any of his co-writers. Is it George yeah. Beatman for that one? I think it is. But Or George Weidman. I don't know how it's pronounced in American, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry. Do write in and let me know, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I think this idea that he's only doing... He, he is merely obeying orders mm. is... Ball of dash and bunkum. It's piffle. He, yes. I mean, he just... He has an odd view of himself at he times. Does. So, for example, he, do, he tends not to talk overly about the stuff where he's just done the lyrics, or the very kind of early stuff. Um, you know, and actually, I love Gypsy. Gypsy is one of my favourite shows. I would hate to hear a Sondheim score for Gypsy. I would hate that. I'm with Ethel on this. I that, like... To, uh, can I hear a waltz? Which I think is one of the best mm. musicals written. Yes. In terms of score but I just you know and again on West Side Story he seems almost slightly embarrassed about having that early success and being a you know, being a collaborator and not having the full control over it but if you I mean when we saw Saturday Night for example which predates mm. West Side Story there is there's not one song in that show that could compare to anything in West Side Story that wouldn't even come close you know, and of course, yes, he's kind of picked up and developed. And there's a follow-up question: yeah. which songs after Gypsy, i.e., which songs composed by Stephen Sondheim in his later career, match the score of Gypsy? Because I like Stephen Sondheim's music, mm. But, mm. and I do think he's melodic. But yes. I'm not going to say that he's the best melodician <laughs> in the world. You know, I think Ju Julie Stein's got something a bit more oomphy to him. I suppose I guess it's the hits. I mean, there you know there are a certain number of big songs that are brought out. But sent in the clouds is, I think, rather a dirge. 
I know this blasphemy. <laughs> I think well, I cannot yeah. disconnect a song from what I see in the theatre. A, a song like Send in the Clowns, it always, always moves me to tears when I see it played in the theatre. I'm like, sometimes I'm a weeper, <laughs> so I cannot... But when I see somebody singing Being Alive in, in, in the show, I find it incredibly moving. The same with Send in the Clowns. It's such a poignant moment in, in that show, and it just works so well. So I cannot... I find it really difficult to disconnect the songs from the characters... Um, and, and from the shows they're in. Very self-regarding. Song, Eve, think, which though. is very bad, because there's about a month, there's about a million <laughs> review shows out there which do exactly that. Pull them out and see if they stand on their own. Yep. I know, and when I listen to them, I always think of how the song fits yeah. in that show. I, I, I oh. kind of make that connection. So what about a Sondheim show you've not seen? If I gave you a song from The Frogs, which I'm guessing you won't have seen, I haven't how seen would it. you respond to it, but none of us have? I find it difficult to enjoy. Oh, so, really? like Assassins, I've never seen Assassins, and I find it one of them. I enjoy it and I'll listen to it, but I find it very difficult to relate to because I've never seen it. And it's very difficult to to imagine how the songs fit into the com- context of the play because I haven't read the play either. Yeah. So When you're watching it, it's still quite difficult. Mm. Assassins? Say. Yeah. Oh, I think Assassins is quite jolly. <laughs> Yeah, well, Ross has jolly. described it before now as A-level sun time. Yeah. <laughs> it's not beginner's sun time. No. Yeah, I think that's a fair answer. Right, we've seen Passion and we've generally... I mean, I'm going to put my... Uh, I'll give you my two pen on it. I, I, Passion has always been my least favourite Stephen Sondheim music because it, it does the things I don't like. I don't... This is my view. I don't actually think it's very melodic and I do like a melody. It is the one where I can't take any of the songs home. Um, what, but what about what about... The production rather than the piece. Ah, well, this is what I want to go on. The 96 (laughs) version with Michael Ball and Maria Friedman, I thought, was a disaster. I'm going to be brutal. I mean, forgive me, I love Michael Ball, but I didn't buy him as Giorgio the hunky soldier. And Maria Friedman, I think, as you quite rightly say, had accidentally... It was um, camp. Well, it was Wicked Witch of the West, stroke East. Um, Whereas this version in uh, the Donmar, this this last year, 2010... I think it was a revelation. I don't think it was enough of a revelation for me to want to go and see Passion again on a regular basis. And it certainly wasn't, um, it hasn't elevated it up from its position vis a vis other shows in my ranking, in my league table of Stephen Sondheim's. But it's now at least in the category of actually I didn't hate it and I got quite a lot out of it. So I thought it was a startling performance, a startling production, and I thought it was beautifully cast. I've got to say, in particular, Alan Cordonier, uh, who played the, the, the Doctor. Um, the only other sort of intellectual soldier in the room who unfortunately is also the cause and the catalyst of all the problems Mm, because he mm. introduces the two and he sort of sets them up and sets them apart and everything he does turns out absolutely wrong and he ends up by killing his patient (laughs) what did you think however of this London production this time? I love the actors, Elena Rogers was a Incredible, and I wasn't a big fan of her before I saw her in Evita, and, and I wasn't completely taken. Uh, I know that's blasphemy, blasphemy for some, <laughs> but I just wasn't. But, but in this production, she was amazing, and there was a subtlety she brought to the role. And, and this is what passion requires it actually requires subtle performance. And this is why the version with Michael Ball and Maria Friedman um, didn't work so well. And also, the bat I'll never forget the bat that all of a sudden got lifted up on stage. I don't know if you remember bed, that, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. It was neither here nor there that production in 1996. This was beautifully done. It was, it was very structured. It was very rigid, um, but in a good way. It, and, and the music, the music sounded beautiful. It was great. I loved it. I mean, Elena was such a star turn, though, wasn't mm, she? Yeah. And Elena is four foot nothing. Yeah, you know, very kind of skinny, and she has the right kind of frail look. She looks like she will die at the end of the performance. Yes, yes. she kind of looks some, you know, looks some well. And of course, the Doma is soup, such an warm soup. <laughs> Help the poor woman. And of course, it's such an intimate space in there that you're only kind of a few feet from the actors, no matter where you sit. Yeah. It's that feeling you can almost kind of reach out, don't reach out and touch, yes. but it feels like you can, yeah. and you, you just feel surrounded the by the piece, which is lovely. It's just such a nice space. I think you may have actually hit on the uh, hit the thing on the head, however, when you said that actually it's subtle and not mm. overarching. And I, my recollection of the '97 production was it was all grand guignol yes. and big yeah. gestures, and I think they have been fooled by the title. This once again is a good Sondheim show where the title isn't at all what the show is about. Mm. We've already said that it's more about a obsession but it is about passion and it is in fact actually about subtlety and manipulation all of which goes on at small level you know manipulation is usually uh, plotting and small level and intricate 
and that's what's going on here. And they've all got little plots. The Doctor has his own plot in a way. Um, certainly, um, Fosco has the, the biggest and most intricate plot of all. Giorgio is the sap. He's the spider mm. in the web. Uh, he's the fly in the spider's web, don't you think? Um, but this show understood that the show was a subtle show, whereas the '97 production thought it was a Steve, uh, an Andrew Lloyd Webber. I was going to say a Stephen Lloyd Webber. There, do you see what I did? <laughs> I do find it melodic, though. I have to say, you there's do? some. I do, yes. I, ah. I songs like happiness, loving you. Um, you see, loving you is the song I can pull a, mem- a, a yes. memory of a melody of. I can't remember the the, the, the tune for. Um, happiness. No one has ever loved me. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. to hear that, Eve. But what about the song? <laughs> do you think it's because though the songs are not announced as songs? You drift it in and you drift out. So you don't have a natural beginning middle and ending they just they always feel to be present you slip in and out of them so it's like don't... the incidental music pops up and gives you a absolutely a song. absolutely so it doesn't kind of it doesn't go like go scene song scene song it's, it's more subtle than that but other composers do that as well Lloyd Webber does that in aspects of love and women in white I guess it's a much more modern form isn't yeah. it yeah. yes there are less hits from uh, aspects of love though is that is that a result of doing that though? I actually quite like aspects yeah. of love maybe I like that sort of show I don't know <laughs> but I know you said in terms of subtlety you like the moment where Elena at the dinner table oh yes she grabs across yes and... she, so the first time they, they meet and have dinner together with all the soldiers around them she grabs Giorgio's hand and she won't let go and it's such a strong moment it's so subtle but yeah. so strong I was sitting on the edge of my seat and it's such a small thing but it said so much I thought that was brilliant but doesn't it remind done. you of what you do when you're a small boy or a small girl I can remember not wanting to uh, have, visiting an aunt having had such a lovely time but I didn't want to leave at the end of the day I must be about five and clinging on to her arm and my parents yeah. having to try and prize me away from that I'm not particularly proud of this memory but I think I need to expose it for the benefit of uh, musical theatre appreciation <laughs> <laughs> I think the one thing that passion perhaps misses is a little bit of humour any humour yes there's well, genuinely I, I think nothing there's a there. little but, but What's that? it's well, I think when she says, uh, I love the ruined castle, probably because it's ruined, I suppose. Oh, I suppose. Yes, it's, 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 it's but, wistful, yes. <laughs> wistful and whimsical at the, at the lowest level. I, I suppose, think it would yeah. work better with a little bit of humour, but then yeah. maybe not. I think she should come in with a full <laughs> a panoply of jokes halfway through the second act. <laughs> Musical talk. I'm Ben Pollard. I'm the co-director of Merrily We Roll Along. And I'm Joseph Beasley, and I'm the musical director of Merrily We Roll Along. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Now, your production of uh, Merrily We Roll Along here at the Edinburgh Fringe was great. And what I liked particularly about it was the fact that you had engaged, I think, thoroughly with the text and the score, which is no mean feat for Merrily We Roll Along. If the original creators couldn't do it originally, and it took 25 years for this particular piece to cook, I'm always really very interested to find out which version people are going for and why they've engaged with this version and why they think that this is the version that they want. So I suppose this is probably a directorial question first, but why this version of Merrily? It's like Radigal, you can pick which one you want. Well, it is, although actually, as far as I understand it, when we dealt with Joseph Weinberg, as this is the version that they sent us, and I think this is the one that we have to do. It's so the authorised. It, it, it is the, the authorised, yeah. I mean, the, the, the process that I always go through in, in directing is when I first get the script, I actually type it all up, which took me three days and I did it in Germany because that really helps me to understand the, the text and just to work out the, the, the bits that uh, might need changing a little bit if, if the show is too long for Edinburgh. Also, it, it, particularly a show that runs backwards, it just helps mm-hmm. you understand the plot. I mean, both of you, did you know Merrily previously and which versions have you seen? Well, I hadn't heard of it until we discussed possibly doing it. And m- musically, the 2012 version is the version that we... Um, that the, the music people that we all listen to because the Maria Freeman version um, no, it's, no the, it's the the, the one in the encores version the New York version because the orchestrations were brilliantly done for that one that's the version that we that I based most of what I did on the list. I don't know forgive me I assume that's Jonathan Tunick plus is it well, they all start it, that it, way it, I know but it was uh, it, it's the New York City encores version and it's got Lynn Michael Miranda. Mm-hmm. But do you know who the original... Uh, did they go mm. back to Jonathan Tunick? I, I honestly don't know. I'd have, no, to, well, I'd have to check that. Yeah, it's a, a, a big hole of ignorance I managed to reveal about myself immediately. <laughs> and I, I, I've been really lucky. I saw it in the Donmar when I moved to London in about 2000, Daniel Evans. I saw it in the Watermill, Newbury, 2006, and I saw the one at the Menier as well. I 
didn't get to see it until the Dolma, exactly like you, but uh, I've loved the original recordings, of course. So the original version from the early 80s, 81 or whatever it is, I, was one of my favourite and earlier Sondheim introductions. Yeah, you see that? Because we didn't really listen to no, that, I'm, did we? I, 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 oh. I didn't listen to the original version until far later. And, and when you listen back to it, you realise how much the musical's changed mm. since, since its original version, that the lyrics have changed, the songs have changed. And, yeah, and, and it was interesting looking back to see what Sondheim... What, what Sondheim added and what Sondheim took out to make, to make it work better as a piece. Well, can I ask that question? Uh, this is a question I'd like to ask both of you, actually, forgive me, which is that this is a highly revised piece and has been developing for 25 years. Can you see the joins? I'm interested both in terms of the book and also in terms of the score, because obviously, as you say, he tweaked the score, but the book itself has also fundamentally changed, and I'd like... Well, yeah, and no, I think, if, am I right in saying the book was changed with James Lapine, not with the original writer, George Firth? Firth. That's right. I'm not sure I can see the joins, actually. I think that's what's clever in it. Because some of the earlier songs, is it one of Gussie's songs is, is sung by Frank in an earlier version? Well, yes, but um, the Not A Day Goes By is sung by Frank, and um, it's not that Frank, one of the opening songs. I can't remember what the name of the song is. Oh, but, is it? Yeah. But, and, and, and is it, it the old, old Hills of Home or something? Well, the, the Hills of Tomorrow Hills of is tomorrow. the school anthem, song. which is sort of uh, how it ends, I think, isn't it, in the original? And I think, is, is that how they... Was that in the 2000 production, the Tomma? I have a feeling it started with, with that rather than with that Frank. In the original, forgive me, in the original version, they're at a party in exactly the way that that Frank is, but it mm. was a party of embarrassment because the film was an appalling flop. Mm. So it used to have lines in it with a, a film that bad, what on earth can you say? Marvellous, wonderful. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, clever. <laughs> the traditional stuff. But um, so the problem is, and that song is very similar. Yeah. to the opening number now and so if, for, for my jaded old ears I'm always waiting for the bit where they're all sneering behind his back but of course not they're all now yes men aren't they in yeah, the well, truest sense and in the opening number um, in, the, in the original they say how did you get to how did you get to be here Mr Shepherd?" they're actually asking him the question whereas in the new version that it's not so obviously directed at him and I think that's it's sort of a bleak question about yeah, how one becomes, how one becomes where, yeah. who they are rather than how he specifically became who he was. Can you, from your... I mean, it's interesting that you've only recently come to the original, shall we say. Can you, from the score point of view as a musical director, can you see... Can you tell where something has been changed? Can you detect later sometime as opposed to earlier sometime? Well... It's a game I like to yeah. play with Saturday Night as well, where there are two new songs. Mm. And because that's from the 50s, mm. most people can spot one, but they can't spot the other, and I think that's absolutely mm. fascinating. Mm. I don't think there are that many differences, like many, many large differences, particularly from what I've noticed. But the most interesting thing is that I think that um, the opening song, The Hills of Tomorrow, and all of the other songs in the musical were sort of were based on small fragments of that. And the fact that that isn't in the, in the new version, I think that's... that's well, great. good thing going is, if you like. Yeah, well, yeah stone, exactly, it, yeah. Really, I think from, it's, for, it's, the, for the new yeah, version, if you like. Yes, yeah, because the tunes, the beginning of the tunes... Practically identical to them. I mean, it is a very integrated score in that sense, but I suppose if you've had 25 years to mix it together and borrow bits and pieces from your own thematic catalogue, I suppose you can do that well, more easily than you can at the time. But what? That's a um, question, by the yeah, way. It, 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 it is extremely inter- you, you go through and in opening doors, the accompanying figure is the tune to Old Friends, mm. and all the, the accompanying figures come back again and again in Old Friends and in, and in um, opening doors again. And, and now you know it's the same tunes in Franklin Shepherd Inc. And so all these it is extremely integrated. And if you go through and actually look at it and work it out, it's incredible how many different bits you can spot well, throughout. The, the blob comes up again, doesn't yeah. it? I mean, the blob is a fantastic piece anyway. Yeah, and it's it over far too soon, if I may say. <laughs> then, you, then you use it to underscore the scene afterwards, but, you know, the party scene as it continues, I think. But then yeah. it's also the, um, the melodic line for... Um, for growing up. That's right. Yeah, it's the yeah the yeah the, when Gussie Gussie's yeah it's, she's the same tune for both, and also the fact that the, the reprises come first because it's in reverse chronological order. Well, not a day goes by. It starts off as the hurt version, doesn't it? Yeah, and then yeah. The begin and then yeah. in chron- in the order that we're seeing it rather than the yeah, chronological in the actual, order. Yeah. It's very hard to describe as well. I think the blob was actually cut from the original production. I believe it's an original song that's been reinstated. I think it's. Fantastic, the blob. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it was one of our favourites to rehearse. Yes, if it was a British musical, it would be called the Islington Set. Or yes, something, exactly. <laughs> which which will make it then much more Noel Coward in tone of yeah. <laughs> pronunciation, I think. So, can I ask? I mean, there are a couple of obvious questions to ask Mer- about Merrily, and I can't avoid asking them, so I'm going to. Casting is challenging, it seems to me, for several reasons. First of all, there is an age range for the characters; they have to. <laughs> I was going to say they don't have to age they have to euthanise <laughs> that's not the right word either is it because I'm putting a Y on the beginning rather than E um, but they have to get younger by 20 years and more naive and more idealistic 
And so that's a big ask of any actor. And then there's the issue of Frank. Now, Frank is an odd character because Frank is a mixture of a corrupted man. He has very horrible aspects, but he's charming. But he's also a man onto which people do project things, and he's too weak to stop them doing so. In fact, he says that, isn't that this overt line about saying yes when he means yep. no? And that's the key line, it seems to me, for his character. To extrapolate... Extrapolate's not the right word. To, to draw from that uh, and to find the right actor and the way, way of making that work must be quite difficult. Like, how do you find... I know you have to go with the people you've got, etc. It is, and that's always the... The risk we take is we, we decide the show that we love and then you cast it and you don't always know if, the, if everyone will be available because we're with a group of, of young people who have to yeah. pay and give up a, a summer holiday. So we just take that risk, but I think it, it worked out great. Oh, yeah, no, I, the casting is excellent, but it is... But we, we it's don't... Quite a challenge. It, it an is, actor, it, I would, yeah. I'm not an actor, but if I were, I would find that a big ask. Yeah, and we don't have... 50 people we can audition for our main roles no, no we, we just did. and I think we were lucky for example that some of the Rory who played Charlie was just was so brilliant in that part it was just, we oh, were just, I think we he's born for that part yeah, yeah I think he is yeah. Yes, he's, if, if he's not a frustrated writer then he really ought to be yeah <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you weren't worried by that because it, you have a sort of oh always, always worried oh, okay. <laughs> always but I think with, with Edinburgh we, we know that we, we're taking a risk and, and we thought yeah. well if we come up here and the reviews may say oh they're far too young as they said on the Broadway production but I think if you, if you find you can always find reasons not to do the show and for us it's important that we just love what we're doing you do it though, yeah yes. exactly and there is no way of winning because an actor is going to be whatever age he or she is you know, whether it's young, old, or in the middle. Yeah. Because I thought it had exactly... The Maria Friedman version is often considered now to be the template from which everyone, you know, the, the high watermark of how to do merrily. And it was excellent. Not flawless, but it was excellent. However, you know, the cast, I think, in one or two cases, struggled with getting younger. Yeah. Um, yours is slightly in reverse, of course, because yeah. you have a, a young cast. And um, I don't know if it's easier to project age than it is to project youth. Yeah. Would you, would you, would you um, care to express a view on that? No. Gosh, I can't it's imagine... It's really. I, I like, couldn't imagine it? pretending to be 18, no. Well, I can imagine pretending. <laughs> yes. Whether I'd be very successful yes. is quite another matter. <laughs> and uh, the challenges are not just in the casting and in the piece, because there are narrative consequences and difficulties which we'll talk about about going backwards but the same is true for the score isn't it the score reflects their 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 return to idealism in the sense it becomes progressively less sophisticated which i suppose is a double-edged sword because by proving by showing you're becoming less sophisticated you're in fact showing how massively sophisticated you are but i think that's just sometime is that boring for you a musical director with your um, with your musicians because you know you, all the challenge the beefy challenging difficult stuff at least ostensibly is on the front and then it becomes more and more what well, no <laughs> like I, a reversion I, to the fifties if you like yeah no I don't think so because well, the um, Sondheim is always challenging musically and so everything mm-hmm. opening doors is up towards the end and that's the most sing- and just um, for the singing itself that's the most difficult one to to learn and to get together. And Our Time is a, is a brilliant song, and mm. I think that's an, a be- such a beautiful song, and that's right at the end, so that, and that's when they're the most idealistic, the, mo- idealistic, the most simple, or the most, and the most youthful. So, no, I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't say that it's boring at all. I think it's it's interesting because yeah, I mean, you go, you go back, and yeah, you go, you, you can see the progression in reverse. And, so. Simple question for the layperson: Is it simpler to play, or is it actually that's just a deception? An um, illusion, perhaps. What, the another sometime? The, the late, the late, no, the, 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 late, late. the, the second act, if you like. Um, no, I think opening doors for the band is right. very difficult. And, um, but then there are songs in the first half that are very difficult. It's, it, no, it, it isn't as simple as just getting more simple as you go through the play and as you go back in time. I don't think it's, no, it's not as simple as that. And even within opening doors, you've got the song yeah. within the song there. You've yeah, got, you know, you've got um, the, who wants to live in New York? Who wants to live in New York? Yeah. It fits so perfectly in that song when it doesn't stick out. Yeah. Does it feel musically different even within the passage of that song? Or is, do you think of it as a separate song? Because narratively yeah. it is. Yes. Is it musically? No, I think not really. It's, it, it, it fits in with... I, I feel that every time you hear that tune, and every, it comes back, I think, in three, different in, in three different instances, then it's completely different every time, or four different times it comes back. And, and every time it's in, a, it's in a different style. and It's, a, it's forever popping. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's basically <laughs> to quote from the... Yeah. It's, and, yeah, and so, no, I think it, it, he, used, he puts it so it fits in each time. And, it, and, it, and it's, 
and, it, and one, one thought I think that's really clever is that you never get the impression that actually Franklin Shepard has only written one song and it's just being used over and over again it sounds <laughs> different every time yeah. even though there's actually only one tune in the play that he's written um, that, that, that we hear uh, yeah because oh, okay. he's only because we only hear one tune that he's written but it doesn't feel like that when you're listening to it you don't think you don't think that's at all and so he, it's really clever the way that he every time by just changing the style and by changing the orchestration it just it becomes slightly different and you don't feel bored by just hearing the same tune I think that's really clever I mean in very broad brush terms would you care to sort of identify what the four different tonalities or feelings are of those the, the variants well there's the um, there's the most well the, the simplest one is when it's just Charlie um, when it's just Frank playing the piano and Charlie mm-hmm. singing in the blob and then and that's very similar when Frank sings growing up and then there's the big Broadway um, brassy razzy hit at the opening of Act 2 when Gussie's yeah when Gussie's singing it and then there's the um, when they're performing it to Joe Josephson in the audition or in yeah <laughs> Yes, so which is much more sort of jolly and yeah, yeah, upbeat, yeah. upbeat, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's and it's funny because as a non-musician, you can you watch the show and actually until you said that, I didn't really make the connection with yeah. it being the, the same form. And that's why it's 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 seamless. Well, it's also one of these shows. I think the more you uh, watch it and see it again, you realise how much more there is, like a good piece of work or a good work of art, perhaps. I mean, I've seen it now several times, different productions, but. This production opened my eyes to some things I hadn't seen previously. Um, simple um, narrative devices as well. When we get to Charlie's television bus stop, shall we say, we get old friends first. And there's a, a line in it about there are too many lives at stake. You know, this, this friendship can't break up. There are too many lives at stake, is essentially the message with that exact phrase in it. Um, but, of course, it's just been immediate. That, that, that phrase is immediately following the almost... It's too appalling for words, but the death toll from Vietnam. We come out of a news yeah. story where they say 45,000 American soldiers have died. And then almost within three minutes, we're told that a friendship can't break up because too many lives are at stake. And you've been shown so brutally how little lives are worth, shall we say. I don't mean that in any sense, but within this narrative. But that's, uh, you know, that you know that's going to fail because of the, the contextualisation that's already been given to you. And then there's other throwaways as well, isn't there? I mean, when he's in the song, Charlie, he says that bit about, um, you know, I've gone in too far, but a friendship is like a garden, it has to keep on growing. And then, of course, that's actually one of the, uh, the lyrics in Good Thing Going. Yeah, it could should have, have kept, kept on, on growing, growing instead of just, just kept, kept on, on, which is a lovely lyric anyway. Um, so I had foolishly missed some of those um, resonances in previous productions, so I'd like to thank you, because your production has opened up yet another layer in this never-ending... Uh, Easter egg, shall we say. <laughs> what we've found with, with audiences is that a, quite a few people have, who know the cast have seen it more than once, and they didn't know Merrily at all. They're not a, necessarily a Sondheim audience, and they all say the second time, oh, it, it was really good to see it a second time because you, you see more things. Yes, once you know the plot, you can concentrate on the detail. Yeah. And that's true anything, isn't it? If anything that's have got any quality in it that, you know, that, that might be worth a second reading. Yeah, and then because... And, Personally, I, I hadn't. Um, my priority before we started hadn't been to read the script and study it really carefully. So, but so yes, as, we've, as we've been going through, um, and you um, realise that all of the minor characters, obviously, all their stories are completely linked, and you can see when people say lines and then they go to the next scene, and then you realise why they've said it. And so, and so for me, as sort of having a bit more of the experience of an audience member, every time that you watch it, you do see something different. And yeah, and we were um, when we because um, as it's such an interesting musical, we we spe- I spoke speak about it with some of the people in the band, and we um, say that it's just, every time you watch it, you don't get bored of it. You just notice new things, and yes. that's why it's so and that's why it's so brilliant. But that's a mixture of the text, the score, but also direction and musical direction as well. I mean, you know, forgive me, how many of those did you want to pinpoint? Or are you happy to let the text do its work? How do you mean? Well, in a direct in a director's point of view, I mean, do some things. You say oh, I can see a connection there. Sometimes, do you think I'll just make that bold enough so people can spot it and realise there's a hook, there's a trap door to this, or do you think actually I'm just, I, I will let the text speak as it stands? I, I don't know if you ever feel that you have to overlay as a director, because the directors you, you bring magic to a piece which I can't do. I think a lot of it actually happens by accident during the rehearsal process because the more Organic. you it, exactly the more we rehearse the, the text, the more we we realise that the connections and and the the poignancy of there's a line where. Um, Mr. Spencer says to Beth, "Your mother would turn in her grave." And then you, because we rehearsed it more or less chronologically, mm-hmm. you're talking about a character you haven't really rehearsed with yet. And then you realise when you start running it that, that you're talking about somebody who's dead, who you do know, and yes. and it, it, it all happens retrospectively, really. 
I've just more of those connections in, I've, um, because you were talking about minor characters as well. I mean, you know, forgive me, uh, there's, at the party at the end, one of Frank's best friends, later better friends, is the, the inventor of the answering yeah. machine. Yes, <laughs> who got rejected. <laughs> the... That's right, at the very beginning, he's, he's a rejected, uh, he's a waiter, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. He goes to Joe for a, yep. uh, to seek... Tyler, it's called Tyler. That's right. Um, he's, he's, uh, he goes, but he goes to the producer for, to seek money, and of course, so he, but he doesn't get it from Joe, but he obviously gets it from somewhere, and he then goes on to become a success and becomes a friend of Frank. Whereas you see the complete reverse for Joe, because the very um, first time we see Joe in the piece, he's now resorting to handouts. Um, so there's a parallel between yeah. the two characters. Which and, I hadn't thought of yeah. until you brought oh. that up. But that, that's, <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> yeah. well, you can watch it one more time. Yes, <laughs> exactly. well, I've got to, so it's lucky. <laughs> Musical talk. And here's noted theatrical producer Dominic Lindsay Beaton talking about the Regent's Park production of Into the Woods. We were talking about the grey the, the, lady and the consistency. And, and the consistency of, of the witch, whereby the witch, you kind of know what she wants, and she wants to keep Rapunzel. Yes. And so when she loses Rapunzel, through her own desires, she loses Rapunzel to, to another man and then to eventually death. Yes. Um, so there is, there is consistency in, in her selfishness from the start. Uh, Mrs. B- arguably Mrs. Baker is also selfish from the start. But, I don't Gosh, yes. It, actually, are the parallels more... Are there more, and more parallels? Yes. I mean, the witch is interesting because I think of the witch as a stern mother because it's, it's absolutely true that she does love Rapunzel. Mm. And she's actually... You don't, I don't think Hannah Waddingham, with no disrespect to her, brought this out quite enough in the second act. But she's actually a broken woman mm. because she has lost Rapunzel. She's got all her looks back. But is the, the loss of her daughter in speech marks. Exactly. Be careful what you wish for once again Absolutely. in the fairy tale. But I, I think you, you told me this um, when you saw the show. There was a song that was in this production that's not always, or hasn't always been in... Oh, well, it was very briefly talking about the score changes, mm. yes. Um, there's the song that was written for the London production in 1990, which wasn't in the original Broadway version, which is called Our Little World, which is now incorporated as a, genu- uh, as a, as a standard p- part of the score. Mm-hmm. And then there were a couple of other changes to the score. Right at the end, in uh, Children Will Listen, they've added a middle eight, which I think was actually written for Barbara Streisand to record <laughs> on one of her albums, and I think actually um, takes the focus away. It, makes the mm. song, it was written to make the song a generic singable song for an album but by sticking it in the show you actually cause diminution of the point yeah you did, um, exactly yeah. no you detract from like, right. the, this the finale the specific what becomes is. the generic mm-hmm. um, in a rather clumsy way I think particularly at the very end when you've been you know you've been you've been everything has been so filigree and clever and, mm. and, and small and detailed and then intimate and chamber PC almost and then suddenly you get this I'm going to be rude Barbara Streisand nonsense stuck at the end but to, to round it Round yeah, it up. Yeah. That's know, right. Um, just to, to, put, to put the bow on the music, as it were, because there's not quite a bow on the show. <laughs> you know, they don't give us that. Uh, and then there was um, a, a, another song, and I can't remember which one it was now, where Little Red Riding Hood and Jack come on and sing the last, um, sing their own extra bits at the end. Yes. Just in a way, it almost to remind people they're there. They've been off stage for a little bit. Mm, mm. Um, Jack, presumably, with the harp. <laughs> well, which, which, is, which is an interesting... Um, their presence... Uh, I know we, we're still discussing the feminism here, but um, the presence of Little Red Riding Hood and Jack is the, I think that in this production, more so than perhaps the traditional fairy tales, the loss of innocence mm. is driven home to a point whereby I think maybe that's one of the reasons why they survive at the end. They're because no longer naive. They're no longer naive. They know exactly what they have to do because they both slaughtered wolves They've uh, killed giants. Um, I mean, putting a pickaxe in this head of a giant is no small feat for no. a child, let alone... Uh, sorry, for a man, yeah. let alone a child. I don't want to do it. <laughs> well, I'd rather hope we can make friends with these giants. Um, but so, so is, is, that, is that one of, one of the moral questions that they're throwing up in this production by the end that this loss of innocence is actually fundamental fundamental to surviving in a difficult and disastrous world if you are if you are innocent you you won't survive who are the realists mm. the loss of innocence is also the development of realism 
Mm-hmm. And that ties in very interesting to me because I think Cinderella is the most realistically minded character because she starts off very low. So she's had bad life. You know, her life has got progressively worse since her father married the stepmother. So, you know, she's more or less, as you say, a, a maid in her own house. Mm-hmm. Um, she has these ambitions, but she she has a very strong philosophical drive all the way through. She's, uh, she's good to her mother and her mother's grave. Um, she doesn't know how to play the situation with the prince at the ball, so she sits down and actually works it through, even though her decision is not to make a decision. Um, there's also just that, you know, she, she's... She understands what's going on with the prince. Uh, once it's, you know, uh, she doesn't show ever great emotions except sadness when her mother's grave is trashed by mm-hmm. the giant. And then at the very end, she's got huge practicality because actually, when they all get together at the end, or the few that still do, to destroy the giantess, it's actually mostly her plan. Yeah. She says, "Oh, let's get the birds to peck out her eyes," and then they say, "Well, we're going to stop her moving around, or well, let's spread pitch on the stairs." I've already done that. Yeah. So they're all going, "Oh, da, da, ba, ba, what do we do now?" And she's going, "Well, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, and we could do that." And it's very clear at the end that she's going to be the driving force of rebuilding the society. Mm. She will use people like um, the baker and yeah. Jack, um, presumably just because they're going to need people to do some breeding, but. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but the, you know, I but think she's right. clearly uh, a sensible understanding. Mm-hmm. And although she's got a wish, uh, she, and she gets it, she doesn't let it go to her head. She doesn't mm. retain it at all costs. Uh, and actually, she probably loses least in the process. She gets I something, she, but she loses what she gets. But she's still better off at the end than she was. And I suppose it's because she's the Cinderella, the pragmatic princess. If, yeah, if yeah. you have it in the context of Into the Woods, because her wish, if we if we look at it um, word for word. Her wish is simply to, to go to the ball. Yes. Her wish is not to, marry to meet prince. the prince. Yeah. And so that's why she runs away from him yeah. for quite some time, because she doesn't know if she likes him or not. So from the start, we have someone who wants a, a wish like everyone else, and when she gets it, the consequences are this prince loves her. Now, she's pragmatic. She has a life that she's not particularly fond of. This is a better option. Mm. This is a much better option. I don't think, by today's stance, I don't think anyone would say that's a bad choice. <laughs> But is it a love match? I don't know. It's, no. it's not a love match. As you say, it's a, it's a status improvement, uh, which takes us back to where we started. Uh, yes. And I think, you know, if we look at um, the uh, agony in the second act, yes. um, that tells you exactly what the princes are about, um, whereby they're, they're, they're doomed to repeat the way that they were written. Yeah. You know, it's not their fault, really. They chase princesses or damsels because they cannot do any other. They, because that's, how, that's exactly how they're written. And I think that's why it's... Um, such a tragically humorous part because they're stuck in it they're stuck they have to fulfill their role in the fairy tale well actually the prince is one of or both princes are two of the characters who actually change very little their journey is very slight they have mm. incidental things happening to them like they do marry their first choice and then they both lose their first choice mm-hmm. Uh, and then they go off and start chasing their second choice. Yeah. Um, but they aren't really caught up vastly in the, you know, they're, they're quite unperturbed by the fact there's a giant stalking the lamb because actually they bump into the prince and he says, I'm off hunting giants, but he's clearly not. He's clearly... And he doesn't care. No, he's, he's not walking even, the other way. Yeah, yeah. But he's also not worried about his own health or safety mm-hmm. because, he, you know, he's just carrying on with what he does. Yeah. In a way, he's almost... Um, well, I suppose he represents lack of community because he's in everything for himself, mm. but um, not in a truly evil way. He's just not, not in, yeah. I think, I think amoral, a, I suppose. Amoral, a, a, a sort of ambivalent because he's been thrust into a situation that he actually has, has no desire to be in and actually doesn't have a grasp on it yeah. either. I think what's, what is interesting about the agony in the second act is it, it's, that's the, the moment when you realise they know what they are mm. and that realisation is actually is torturous for them yeah. but they can't change it so they carry on yeah. whereas the other characters that when they when they realise what they are and what they could become they make the effort to change it they s- get rid of Milky White to get the beans to go up the you know yes. they, 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 there's they, a song in that yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Milky White um, but they, that's what they they, they they can change it whereas they are doomed to repeat their fate and they're aware of that and I think that's I, I did quite like it in the context of... Uh, sorry, I did quite like it. Um, I did quite like it in the second act because it would have, I think, muddied the waters of an already complex mm. web that the second act is, which is, as we've said, is tricky to navigate. And that's why it doesn't quite work as well as the first act. So if you then introduce the princes suddenly to 
become kings and yes. to and, and, and to take charge. Or the other way round, where they renounce their royalty and become sort of um, citizens. Or is it exactly. <laughs> it also uh, wouldn't work. It, w- it wouldn't yeah. work because it comes out of left field, to use the American phrase. It, it comes out of nowhere. And it would, I think, go against what we're saying about these strong female characters, yeah. actually Cinderella taking charge. Princess Cinderella. Yeah. Hmm. I think that's very interesting. I'm not, sure, I, I'm not sure we've got much more we can push on that one. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so overall then, the, in your view, quickly, what was good about the production that we saw and what is good about the, about the show? About the show, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I think universally, I say universally, nationally in England... Um, into or, the woods. Or Britain. Or, or Britain. Yeah. <laughs> let's define out. <laughs> let's, let's start a good definitional see, point here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say, the show itself, no, yeah. um, the, the production received, and I think rightfully so, uh, high praise from audience members and, and the press. You know, I, I think it got four stars across the board from pretty much everyone. Every national press mm-hmm. we have, it got four stars across the board. Um, the Times, the Guardian, the Independent, the Daily Mail. Um, and it was a very good production. My concerns with the production were actually in some of the directing. Because I was, or rather we were sat on, I'd say, the, the well, looking left at, bank. So looking stage at the stage. right. Yeah. So stage right, the left bank. And, for example, when the giant comes through the forest... It's actually blocked behind quite a few trees, so I can kind of see it's there, so I can kind of get the effect. But the centre bank and the right-hand side bank were in hysterics, because obviously mm-hmm. they get the full impact visually. Um, and there were also a few blocking moments of characters running on, not even to say a line, but yeah. running on because they have to, and then running off again, that just looked a bit sloppy. And that's not to say that they have to cut out the entrance and the exit, mm-hmm. but rather it was a tricky stage to navigate, and it wasn't quite perfected to me I would say you know always just bring the character on a little bit earlier from a different entrance that makes it seem more natural so what we're saying is there isn't quite an integration between the should we say the the, the blocking the choreography and the, and the set, set design yeah. and the set design that they had um, which I loved I loved the set design yeah. that they had I thought it was spectacular and also, of levels yes. and I did really like the costumes I think the costumes and the directing on the whole was, was very good but there were these elements of blocking where I did think to myself has someone sat in the worst seats in the house to watch the show and said to um, Timothy Schroeder, who's the, the director, I couldn't see those bits. That's one thing because far, there were just too frequently, there were moments when jokes were lost. There was a moment where Rapunzel, I assume, stumbled out drinking yeah. because the rest of the audience laughed. But we couldn't see it, did we? No one in our bank laughed because we couldn't see it at all. Um, and so I think there, there were elements of that which which pulled the show back, but not in a major way that I'd, I wouldn't have recommended it. And I did like the fact that it was big audiences. It was selling well, mm. because I think the show deserved it. Um, My view on this, this production is that I enjoyed it immensely. I don't think it surpasses the 1990 London version I saw. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, and it's going to play to all my particular prejudices, but actually uh, it was played more as a drama than a comedy, I thought. Because you mentioned a couple of misfire jokes. I actually didn't think that the comic... The golden thread of comedy, because it's not a comedy by any means, but it's it's quite light-hearted in a lot of places, especially and, in the first act. Yes, as well. and not just because of the uh, the baker's wife. Mm-hmm. Who, in fairness, actually gets most of the laugh lines. Um, but I, I think there was more incidental comedy in the past, and I think that felt toned down, and the drama for me felt toned up, mm. and I enjoyed that. But. Um, for me, I, I do like an, an occasional spot of lightness. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't quite... I mean, you could argue that it shouldn't be a light production anyway. In fact, actually, we're, we're taking us very back to the beginning about nature's lighting and the fact we were outside. The show, as it gets darker and darker, particularly in the second act, it's we were seeing it on a summer's night. It started off light, and just as night fell locally in London... Uh, it became very dark dark, and of course that's exactly what's happening to the characters they're fighting for their lives in the second act Uh, and I thought oh lord I don't know who they've got on board to to change the sky but he he did a marvellous job which actually I I think the just to touch slightly off of uh, Stephen Sondheim for a moment the open air theatre for the past two years they've commissioned really great work where that happens earlier this year they had the crucible Arthur Miller's the crucible and the same concept applies whereby 
as they get darker and darker mm. into eventually the prison. And the, and the scaffold. And the scaffold. <laughs> night has fallen. And it's a, it's a dark place to live. Whereas at the start, it's, it's morning. Yeah. And it is bright. And I think the, whoever's commissioned these shows has been very savvy with the commissioning. And Into the Woods is, as you say, is, is no exception to that rule. I think Hello Dolly last year might have been, but I'm not going to push the point. <laughs> that was last year, last. That was, a, I think, episode 150 or something. Yeah. Um, and overall, then, uh, we, 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 the final bit of that question was, what do you think of the piece? Of the piece. Now, it is, it is, it is very good, but problematic, I think, mm. which is... Which is and, I'm, and I'm saying this actually from a producer's standpoint, I think. And it, the problematic nature is, I I love this production because the organic, as you said, the, the organic nature and the design went very well with the concept of Into the Woods. But um, I don't know how to sell it. I wouldn't know how if if, if Stephen Sondheim wasn't Stephen Sondheim. Yes. And in in today's climate of getting new musicals on, which is no small feat. I mean, it's never been a small feat to get new musicals on, but it, it's so expensive now. If you said, I've got this, this, this great concept of turning these fairy tales upside down, it's quite dark. Oh, is it a children's story? No, it's not. It's actually for adults. Quite specifically it, not a children's no, story. But, it, but it's, it, it's fairy tales, yes. Okay, and so at, at the end, do we do do they all live happily ever after? I think no. At the end of the first act, they live happily ever after. And at the end, of the second act, they don't live at all. <laughs> so, uh, from a producing Messily standpoint, ever the, after. The, <laughs> the problematic nature would be who can take a risk on that? I, because I know if it wasn't Stephen Sondheim, I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't as a producer. I wouldn't. That's a very interesting point. Yes. And I'm not talking about the, the structure being problematic here, or like we've already spoken about the second act, kind of throwing up the difficulties because you're having to invent new fairy tales on these old fairy tales that we knew already, which is why the first act is so strong and so beautiful. Um, because we, we've discussed that element, but just as, as a piece, where does it fit? I, and that's, that's, that's what would concern me. And I think that's why it is tricky. I think that's why it was a good choice for the open air theatre because it put a slant on it that made it relevant but actually would you put it in in the West End again and have to how would you do that Mm. without it being a song you know it is a song time so that's kind of a moot point but if it was a new musical how would how would you market that yes the canon it falls into is the song time canon and in no other and I I think the point you make is so well made that actually you probably he couldn't have written it earlier either Mm. you know it's 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 late middle period it has to be um, because it's very sophisticated you know more so than funny thing happened more so actually than anyone can whistle um, but they're, they're, those are broader brush pieces yeah where um, he's he's gained his audience yes so that he can say oh this is the new song time I have to go see that but where does a filigree musical fit in the West End anyway these days by filigree I mean sophisticated and you know Oh, come on. Grease is a phenomenal show. How could you talk that way about yes, it? Yes, and I did see Legally Blonde relatively <laughs> recently as well. But, you know, that, that's the fodder. I mean, they're good. They're very good. I'm not criticising them. But um, Ragtime didn't do very well. And that's a similar-ish piece. Even mm-hmm. that's more broad brush than this, I think, though. But, we, but then what you have is, I think, the way the markets answered that is theatres like the Open Air Theatre, the Many a Chocolate Factory and the National they they have answered that question in the marketplace because a commercial West End producer is not going to go, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put on, um, what what could we say? Uh, what, would be a tr- what would be a really tricky sometime to sell on the West End? So Into the Woods could arguably work. So we need, Todd could arguably work because they've got a bit of razzmatazz, a bit of big set pieces. Pacific Overtures would be very Pacific good. Overtures. Okay, <laughs> let's put on Pacific... <laughs> Do you know specific? Yes, yeah, yeah, I do yeah. know specific yeah. overtures. So, what, how would how could you how could you sell that? It's a big gamble. Whereas companies that have subsidy and are known to reach an, a sort of educated theatre going audience, the many a chocolate factory being a, a good example, that can then create a transfer. I think that's where sometimes going. I mean, we have Passion yeah. currently playing at the Donmar. You know that's a that's a really good example of where his work has to fit, 
and there's no stopping a little light music. Yeah. You know, that's that's commercially it's reached a lot of people. It does have quite a few famous actors in it in each version that's been done both in the West End mm. and on Broadway, which helps, obviously. And elsewhere, Leslie Caron is doing it in Paris. Really? Wow, I didn't know that. Mm. Crikey. So there you go. But that that's kind of that's that's what helps that, that particular production. But they're transfers from smaller subsidized houses that can take the financial risk. And they're feeder houses as well. Absolutely. So, you know, if, if it pays off, then the big boys gobble it up. Absolutely. Particularly if it comes from the chocolate factory, obviously. Well, <laughs> Sonia Frieden Productions, I think they must see every show at the chocolate factory yeah. on the off chance that they can transfer it. Well, it's such a good cafe, there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think that's, as a show, that would be my concern. What's your opinion on my thoughts? Well... As a show. As a show, I, th- I, th- I think it's... <laughs> This is a good example of uh, sometime in that it is a flawed piece, uh, Act Two in particular, but it is as close to a successful sometime as you're going to get. Um, it has been said that it's the most accessible, simplistic on the face of it, and yet um, mm-hmm. le- considerably um, not uh, underneath. I tell you why I think it's the most successful. I'm just thinking why is this better than Ragtime, mm-hmm. which is obviously not by him. And I think the reason is that Ragtime tackles themes and politics and this is about the human condition and themes and politics go in and out of uh, in and out of favor whereas the human condition does not yes it's all dressed up in the trappings of fairy tales but actually it's about um, anyone can go and see this um, and if they are human and have human emotions so as long as they're not sociopaths (laughs) Uh, and I very rarely go to the theatre with sociopaths, <laughs> if I can help it. Um, they never pay for the ice cream. <laughs> I, uh, I think you will get something out of it, whereas mm-hmm. I think you could very easily go to ragtime and say, I'm not actually interested in this period of history or these particular political drives, mm-hmm. which is sad, but there you go. But so, true. Yes. But true. So I'm going to, am I going to say sometimes best piece? <sighs> Oh, if I do, I'll get the emails. Right, I'm going to do it, and let's see what happens. I think this is Sondheim's best show. It's uh, Let me put it this way. It's my second favourite Sondheim show, but I think it's more accessible than Merrily, which is the one I like mm. best. Mm. I, I, well, I think if it's your, your second favourite and most successful, that's pretty good kudos. So that's foss at musicaltalk.co.uk. <laughs> Please be nice. <laughs> Don, thank you very much indeed for that very uh, interesting conversation. We've discussed feminism and fascism and lots of other things that begin with F. Um, But but genuinely interesting um, forensic. There we are. There's another one. (laughs) No, no, and I think uh, it it was a very good production and it's a good show. Um, And I'll be interested to see in Stephen Sondheim's 81st year (laughs) what's put on in the West End and on Broadway. No coward. (laughs) Musical Talk remembers Stephen Sondheim. And here's West End actress Valerie Cutco talking about her involvement in a Stephen Sondheim review. Valerie, I have to say, it's a real delight to meet you. And I'm also delighted to know that you're here in the West End in German Street Theatre with a very interesting show at the moment, sort of celebrating not the darker side, but the the less well-known side of Stephen Sondheim, perhaps. How did you end up in this show? And what's its attraction to you? Oh, goodness. Well, I'm, um, as most musical theatre goers, a, a tremendous fan of Sondheim and have been since I began singing. I was thinking about um, what particular meaning Sondheim had to me and um, realised that until I started to hear his songs, I actually wasn't the hugest musical theatre fan. I was a bit a bit of a snob um, <laughs> for apologies to your listeners who grew up watching American musicals of the 50s and loving them. I, I was a bit troubled by them. I thought that they were hokey and shallow and stuff. I now realize that there's a tremendous depth and it takes tremendous skill to perform. But my reaction as a child was that it was very... Um, surfacy and one level and people came out and said what they were and what they felt in quite an obvious way and when I began to hear Sondheim I suddenly recognized that musicals could also be about people whose inner inner lives were conflicted whose identities were not so sure 
who were not what they seemed on the surface, and we could see what they themselves couldn't see, but often they had insight into themselves as well, and I hadn't, I hadn't been aware of this in, in the early musicals that I heard. So from that, I started to listen to as much as I could, and in cabaret I've always used Sondheim in my repertoire. And how I came to be here specifically is that I have a long friendship and association with Tim MacArthur, our director and producer in the, in the world of cabaret, and have for a number of seasons hosted Cabaret in the House at Lauderdale House in Highgate, which is the brainchild of Tim and Catherine Ives, and uh, have had the enormous privilege and pleasure of hearing season after season of amazing West End performers, but also people whose primary focus is cabaret, and uh, learned a lot and had a ball. So I, I knew Tim through that, and he rang a few months ago and said that he was doing this review and knew my love of Sondheim, and uh, so that's how I ended up being at German Street. Now you've, in, you've raised a couple of very interesting things there already. You were talking about the difference between stars who've done musicals and people who do cabaret. What, would you like to elaborate a little bit more on that? That's very interesting. Is there a difference in tone or a difference in performance or different skills? Well, do the, you think? <laughs> There's um, no right or wrong answer, I think. Obviously, skills, a, a basic ability to exactly. carry a tune and express yourself through song is uh, primary to both disciplines. But obviously, in a musical, you're playing someone and inhabiting another person's feelings and thoughts and ideas, whereas in cabaret, even if song by song you're taking on a character. Yes. Uh, ideally, I'm getting to see you. I'm getting to see who you are, what your feelings and worldview are, hopefully something of your, um, your emotional life and for, sense for of humor. As a, yeah. as, as a cabaret performer, it really is you, the person. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to see yeah. the whole of you, but the more of you that I do see that really is your basic take on the world and your response to it, if I feel like I have a, a connection with you in cabaret, then I feel like I've had a satisfying and um, fulfilling, nourishing kind of night. That's immediately fascinating. Um, cause it's, it's almost <laughs> as, no, it, it genuinely is because it's it's almost as though for the cabaret performer, the the songs are a mirror that helps reflect the personality of the performer, whereas for the musical performer, the um, the songs are a deflector rather than a reflector. Well, I, I don't know if it's a deflector because it's always you, even if you're mm. playing someone that. The feelings and the ideas and the intelligence oh, behind it is drawn from you, and um, and I, I truly believe that the best musical performers, even even doing the broadest, strangest, yeah. funniest character work, are, are drawing on themselves. But um, perhaps the, it, it is more immediate and um, raw in cabaret. Yeah, that, I, I hope you didn't mind that little exploration. It's, I, I, no, I, I'm fascinated by both. And I'm, sometimes I think they're very similar and sometimes I think they're quite different. Well, cabaret is so broad, and this I find at Lauderdale House. You can get a wonderful set from a musical theatre performer doing musical theatre repertoire just because their virtuosity is so terrific, <laughs> their sound is so great, and their intelligence and their interpretation. And even if there's very little patter and chat, you, you get a sense of the person just because they're so at home in their, in their singing and in their set. So you can't directly just transfer a strong musical theatre performer who's done a lot of West End stuff, and they'll be a joy to watch. But Likewise, you may have a, a voice or a persona that isn't easily cast in West End principal roles or a, uh, an interest in a um, more offbeat kind of repertoire and have an equ equally thrilling kind of afternoon. And I just think cabaret can cover all sorts of repertoire, music, style, modern, you know, everything from... Ivor Novello to um, the latest musical theatre writers to Tom Waite. Um, mm. We've heard some rock and roll. Um, at a On the same programme? The most interesting programmes actually cover a great variety of styles. Not, not all singers um, choose to do that or even, <laughs> even can do that. And, but um, people come up with all sorts of surprising things. It's fantastic. Which I think takes you back to what you were saying earlier, that the what seems surprising in the set or what people are coming up with is once again a reflection of who they are as a person because they are the people who will have either come up with the idea or help develop it or whatever. So yes, that's why I think... Reflection, isn't it? Yeah, so the, the more you do it, the more into the world of cabaret you go, the more interesting your repertoire becomes, the more songs you accumulate, the more you find your particular 
areas of interest and composers that you like. And um, in London as well, there's also a, 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 there's new writing that's available um, if you if yeah. you start working. And I, I did a concert. Actually, it's on your website, isn't it? Thank you. A couple yes. of weeks ago at the Cochrane, out of the yes. piano, the Tim Williams Award um, produced by the Frank the, Lazarus. Actually. Yes, 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 brilliant Frank Lazarus, and produced by indefatigable and tremendously uh, encouraging and flattering and lovely Bruce Wall. Yes. Um, the level of writing, of musical theatre writing, if you don't want to do uh, standard music or even music that's coming out of New York, because a lot of mm. a lot of repertoire one hears is modern um, New York musical theatre writers, Jason Robert Brown, John Bacchino and things, yeah. beautiful. But London is full of writers like that. If you just poke around a little bit, you find really marvellous and interesting songs. We've got a very healthy fringe. In fact, I think our fringe is healthier than the West End in a way. You can sort of poke around and find this is where the interesting stuff comes up. For 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 new musical writing, yes. just just for purely economic reasons, yes. because um, it's so hard to get new musicals on it at a West End level. It takes so many stages. So um, on the fringe for for new composers and new lyricists, if you just have a look, lots of exciting young companies and theatres, the, the Finbra, and. Um, the Landor and all these places, yes. yes, there's hundreds of them, well not hundreds, but there's a, there's a, they're, they're becoming more and more established, there's a little circuit almost I think of, of West End fringes or London fringes, Yes. upstairs at Gatehouse and places yeah. like that, yes. Yes, and, and festivals supported by Mercury Musicals, um, yes. Perfect Pitch, they're, um, it's there. If you, if you just have if a look, look as it, it, yeah. if you look for it, and, and a great resource for performers. Um, unfortunately, it's not hugely financially funded. And no. So, and there's the real world for you in a nutshell, I fear. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I suppose the ideal is that you get in a nice, solid West End show that's running for a while, and you can get by the income from that, and then have enough time in the day to explore more creative things if you're a musical mm. theatre performer. One of the things I think that attracts people to a series like Cabaret in the House is the ability to break free of what they're doing eight shows a week, mm. as well as showing themselves off and not like the character that they're playing. But um, we have people who've had tremendous, you know, they've played all of the big West End houses, and yet I love, <laughs> I, I love seeing the sort of freshness and newness and frank, frankly the nervousness before they go on to our little room to sing oh, really? things that they've chosen themselves unamplified and direct to a, a little a little room of people who are going to see them I close it's, up. It's once again that idea isn't it almost that cabaret is you not unsupported but perhaps less supported it's because in, in a show you've got the other performers you know you've rehearsed it a thousand times whatever a cabaret is Shorter run, quite often, perhaps only one mm. performance. So you're right; it's very that, that interesting element of nerve. Of course, you can have yeah. hugely oh, highly yes. produced cabaret. I mean, Marlene Dietrich or <laughs> or um, No Coward. Yes, yes, the, that great Age of Review in the fifties, mm. and even um, I, I saw Uta Lemper in one of the Shaftesbury Avenue the, the, theatres, beautifully lit, and and obviously hundreds of people. But essentially, the 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 thing of addressing uh, people directly and making them feel as if you're speaking to them directly and letting them see your passions and your fears and feelings and your sense of humour is the same regardless of the size of house. I think that must be true, yes, I think you're right. Although most of us aren't going to be playing no. those huge houses, <laughs> um, and particularly in London where I don't think at this time in history there is a, a huge cabaret audience. No. And indeed it's... As you know, we're, we're losing Peter on the park. Well, this is what made me think about it, reading about the, the amazing performers who were coming to see that season close and realising that even they weren't able at this stage to fill, um, to fill Peter on the park, which is a, a shame because... It's, it's appalling. It's worse than a shame, isn't it? Yeah. I, th I think maybe there's just um, a time for things. I mean, Light Review in the 50s here was hugely popular, I don't know, it must have something to do with economic and um, national issues and <laughs> politics and what, what, is, what is popular. I Ho hope it will come back. So do I, very much so. 
But this show, the, yes, the this show. show. Well, well, let's just take a backtrack slightly. You said that Sondheim, almost in a way, was your way into musical theatre. He opened my eyes. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, thrilled me. Can you remember anything in particular? Was there a particular song or a particular show that suddenly swept you away, or was it the, the mass of intellect that comes from the canon? <laughs> <laughs> I think probably it was, I was. Um, 16 or 17 when I did a first production of Company at the Company. local Summerstock Theatre. I did a couple of those actually. Then I just started to listen to more and, and, and watch more Sunday in the Park. And, um. Well, Company is the way I got into Stephen. Oh, Sunday really? Well. Um, I listened to a, uh, a radio, they did a potted version on the radio. Um, so it was much shorter, but uh, I was just completely, gosh, I thought this is amazing. Mm. Um, and I never really looked back. So yes, and and you you did suddenly hear people singing, not about loving someone purely, but loving someone, but being frightened of it or um, angry and perhaps um, more real emotion. In fact, yes, not just I love you. Well, what an interesting thing to say because I think mm. most people would would feel that the big romantic arias of um, oh I don't know Carousel were real emotion and of course they are mm, a bit untempered for my life yes yeah. that's exactly it untempered by uh, by um by conflict or um other emotion other yeah, other yeah. emotion which life i think is very is, rarely a lonely visitor is it <laughs> did, did you just say do you have you just come up with that yeah sorry was that problematic no it was beautiful oh, oh, oh gosh really love oh. love is rarely a lonely visitor it probably sounds better than it, I meant it. I'm no, so I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic quotation because oh. it's true. It usually is tempered by ambivalence or, um, you know, a slight feeling of embarrassment or um, over... certainly fear. I think. Yes, yes. I think the fear. I don't of think it's just you is, and me. Is it? Well, I, I bet it's interesting, isn't it? Because we're both immediately connected with what we know it to be, mm. and you know, so it's not just a one-off experience for any of us. I think you know the. You're quite right, a lot of people do like the Rodgers and Hammerstein approach, but I, I, I still prefer something which, in a heightened sense, or less heightened in some time perhaps, but it still speaks more to me. Uh, yes, I like to think of myself as a complex human being. Where I am is another matter. Well, well we are, but you see, that I, I, I'm starting to think that this is the great challenge of playing those big musicals, like a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical or... Um, Learner and Low, yes. is is taking what is spare and seemingly simple on the surface and finding in the text and then in yourself things that um, you can show as an actor are actually going on that person that, that makes them complete. And I think it's there, but I think maybe it's not it's not always found, and particularly mm. in all of the am dram and the things that um, one's first exposed to in musical theatre. So I actually have tremendous admiration for people who can play a big, bold, broad song and find all of that stuff in it. That's right. Well, I, it's, 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 finding the, uh, it's, it's finding the other levels of Ethel Merman almost, isn't it, in a way? Mm. It's, uh, you know they're there, it's just finding them under this... Uh, she didn't release them, although obviously I'm underplaying her in a way. Well, I think I she mean, gives more, more than people pretend. I think people have been... Um, bashed into submission by the voice and think that what you're getting is just that. But actually, she was an extremely accomplished performer. Yeah, and, and we haven't seen her performances in Gypsy on stage and things no. where, where you probably would get... Uh, um, but even all on recordings of... of um, there's a feeling. And you get your gun, bizarrely. Mm. Uh, you still get um, touches of insecurity, which, you know, you don't associate with Ethel Merman. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but she, I, I think maybe you don't get to be a star of that stature without... Um, without complexity, if you're just a one-note yes. uh, performer. So I'm sorry, we, we keep, keep we keep. We keep. Oh, it's too fascinating, you see. You're too, you're too interesting. So the Sondheim show. Now it's changed its name. Maybe that's an interesting hook. It was going to be Secret Sondheim. Yes, which I thought was a terrific yes, title. I My understanding is that um, Barbara Cook will be coming to town oh, with um, Sondheim and Sondheim, and that uh, for from a, a purely. Um, practical and logistical, logistical kind of, point yeah. of view, they would like all of the reviews which are Sondheim related not to have his name in the title. Oh, I see. Oh, well, yes. Um, so, that, so that that will be the Sondheim show. Fair enough. And uh, so our show is now called it's Classic true. Moments, Hidden Treasures. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that there are some classical 
classic classic Sondheim moments. Uh, but a few hidden treasures. Well, as shall well. we talk about the hidden treasures? Because once again, Sondheim is. Even people who don't know musicals know that there is a Sondheim, and most of them know some Sondheim songs. Mm. Sometimes the pop ones, you know, Losing Sending My Mind clowns. and Sending the Clowns, absolutely. Uh, and people are aware that Sondheim is, in the popular um, mindset, intelligent and clever and witty. Um, but surprisingly unmined in some areas. I feel that people also feel that he's less tuneful than, say, Jerry Herman, which um, is not... No, not I'm... not the case, but yeah. there are some quite complex melodies as I'm finding yeah. in rehearsals and things which don't easily go into the ear the first time you hear them, but you want to hear them again. So I think that's... A... Why, why do you think, therefore, that there are still dark pockets, if you like, of Sondheim's canon that haven't been explored? I mean, for example, I know The Frogs went to Broadway only recently, but it's still not widely known, is it? It isn't, and I've never heard it. Can you tell oh. me about the frogs? Oh well, I, it only had four songs in it, I think, originally. And it was you, you, you know from 1973. It was um, for students. It's a mm, version based of on Aristophanes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, funny enough, Gilbert and Sullivan mention Aristophanes in the Pirates of Penzance. So you know, there's a good historic throwback in the world of musicals. There. Um, yes, a, funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Was that or was that another? That's Plautus, I think. Oh, there you go. Yeah, but he's, Those he's, Greeks <laughs> and their and their musicals. Um, <laughs> Crazy guys. But the, the, the frogs. What I do know is was it was done in 1973, and because it was always historically been set around a swimming pool, so people can pretend to be uh, frogs. Yes. Um, it hasn't been revived very often, and of course the original show didn't have very good acoustics, only mm. a small number of songs. Did they do it at the Bridewell? Wasn't that a swimming pool? Yes, and it was actually a swimming pool. Oh. I think that was a few years ago, though. Yeah, I don't think but it, it, it went to, I believe it went to Broadway only a couple of years ago with Nathan Lane on the success of his Funny Thing Happened. Ah. So I believe Sondheim wrote some new songs for it. Ah. So it's been expanded slightly. Have you heard them? I have got the soundtrack album. They are very good. He's right, because he's very good at going back to the mindset that he was in. So his songs, they feel like 1973 songs. They don't feel like 2008 songs. So, so that they'll meld yeah. with the other ones. Yes. Because he did the same thing with Saturday Night. You know he wrote two yes. new songs for Saturday Night in 2000 yeah. for his 1950s show. And they, I've, I always ask people, can you spot which of the new songs? And no one ever can. Yes. Yes, I wonder whether The Wizard of Oz will, will have that effect. Aren't <laughs> there some new songs being written for that when that comes in? Oh, oh, I think Andrew Lloyd Webber is really? writing some new... A well, few brave. new tunes. <laughs> I, I, Gosh. I, I, I just heard it in terms of the... Uh, we're getting off our subject again, but I heard in terms of, of the casting of the witch um, that they may give her a tune. Oh, well, I suppose she yes, that's, that's hearsay, though. That's yeah. complete. I may as well have just made that up. But it's a very good point that the witch doesn't have a song. Mm. Which, in a casting point of view, is kind of great. Then they can yeah. get a great... Any kind anyone. of great star, but if they get a singer, then she'll want a song, I would think. Yeah, it's been known. <laughs> so tell me, um, are you allowed to tell us what the songs in this splendid review are going to be? Hmm. Yes, I am. Um, a number that were... Uh, it seems to me that Marry Me a Little and Follies share a number of tunes that he's, he's switched back and forth because some that I have associated with Follies on our scores are... Um, attributed to Marry Me a Little. Um, but there's uh, Can That Boy Foxtrot. Which is, which a, is a splendid rude song. Or, or it is. Suggest suggestive, isn't it? It is. And I think we're going to I think we're going to have great fun with it, actually. <laughs> um, the Girls of Summer, which is from, uh, is that from Marry Me a Little as well? It's been, it's been sung in Marry Me a Little, isn't it? But wasn't yeah. it written in the 50s, I think? Really? I it think has a so. feeling about it. It's a, it's a fantastic song. Um, we have Laura Armstrong, who's got a, just a stunning voice, um, who was recently in Little Night Music in the West End. So rather than doing, say, Send in the Clowns, we're going to do Every Day a Little Death. Uh, Laura oh. and I will sing that together, which I think will be... Um, difficult to sing without crying actually because it's so um if that is a song that has a an underlying sadness in it and a bright surface in i think so much of that particular musical does anyway though don't yeah, you I think, think it's, it's yeah. i mean the waltz time sort of pretend uh, hides romanticizes and almost upbeats if such a, fra a verb can be said to be created yeah. uh, 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 essentially uh, uh, an unraveling tragedy it seems to <laughs> yes be. I, I think it i think it may be my favorite little night music um 
John Paul Heavey's doing Everybody Says Don't, which I think is from... Um, the one that was also on in London just recently. Yes, Anyone Can Whistle. Anyone Can Whistle, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, um, and we're doing several numbers from Assassins. One very beautiful and creepy number called Unworthy of Your Love. That's just a, a fantastic version of this song that sounds like a love song and then gets, gets rather um, twisted and, and scary for a moment. Um, because they're actually, they're assassins actually singing it to their victims. And we're also doing this very strange uh, quartet called The Gun Song, also sung by the assassins, with um, a tremendous four-part harmony section that we've been working on. But again, really a, um, a rather beautiful love song to a gun. Um. <laughs> yeah, barbershop killers. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Anything from Evening Primrose? Oh, yes! Isn't that... The, did you see that at the last I've never, musicals? I, no, I've never seen it. I've only got the soundtrack out Oh, it. it's it's so delicate and strange and lovely. Um, and uh, if, you we're can, good. if you can find me, I'm here, I think is one of the songs from that, isn't it? Yes, it, I'm, I'm sure it is. We're doing Take Me to the World, which is, from that show, probably as, as well-known a song as that you'll get. Yeah. But people still don't know it because it is so hard to find. But I, I think that's a lovely and strange music. Once again, one of those dark, undiscovered corners of Stephen Sondheim's canon, really. It's very strange. Mm. So how are these selected, do you know? And uh, have there been any changes? Oh, um, oh, oh, it's, these uh, these were selected uh, by our director, Tim, who's yeah. been um, putting together shows of this nature a bit. I think the last one was uh, um, Coloured Lights, which was Candor and Ed. That's right. But I think he's just having run cabaret seasons for year after year and been involved in casting musical projects he's just got a huge Sondheim connection that he spread out all around his floors and just listened to song after song after song and came up with this uh, combination and I think it's great um, there are a few slightly better known ones like Anyone Can Whistle and Sooner or Later which audiences will enjoy I think because um, my experience is that you you want a few things yeah. that you that you know and listening to cabaret if somebody doesn't chuck in a few that you think oh I like this song you you miss out of it you see I think that's uh, once again I watched Dick Tracy recently because I think sooner or later he's known because of the, the Madonna connection mm. I think there's an awful lot of people forgot that Stephen Sondheim wrote several songs for Dick Tracy too. Um, and my favorite I have to say is live alone and like it um, and I've only just been able to find a copy of the Mel Torme version, which is the one they use in the film, because it wasn't included on any of the original soundtrack. I wonder why not. No, I don't know either. I With found it on an album called Mel Torme at the Movies. Mm. So it's a collection rather than... Uh, but it's a lovely... Um, do you know... Do you know I don't. I would, I'd oh, like, I'd I'd like I'm to, not going to pretend to sing it to oh, you. <laughs> um, but it was... Um, it was put in... Putting it together, which was a Stephen song yes. review a few years ago with... Um, Oh, uh, Julie Andrews, of course, yes. Yes. About ten years ago now, I think, possibly. Slightly more, who knows. <laughs> oh, I have to quite like to hear So that. what's your favourite song, if you don't mind me asking, from that? Is that is, is, or maybe that's a silly question. Can you give me a favourite song from the ones in this particular review? Well, I'll tell you what my... I, I think that it will probably vary once in the course of the run, depending on um, how things are going, and what, you, what you're feeling on the day, and how, how um, audiences are responding, and the ones that you feel you're hitting the mark on. Um, but at the moment, um, one that was new to me is Last Midnight from Into the Woods, which I think will try a slightly different uh, approach to. Oh. Well, I hesitate to say much um, <laughs> because, because it's in formation, but I think, I mean, we're all aware that there will be, I, uh, what I think will probably a, be a very splendid production in Regent's Park of the show. At the Open Air Theatre. At the right. Open Air Theatre, with a, just a stunning cast. I mean, H Hannah Waddingham, I think, it will be perfect as mm. the witch, and Jenna Russell as the baker's wife. I, anyway, it's going to be great. And the nice thing about a little review like this is that the songs don't need to fit into the context of the show. And you so, can take them out and, and I think with and, I yes. think with most of our material, um, it won't be necessary to know the show, and, and each each number should be clear on its own, and sometimes very consciously done in a different way because we can. Yes. And, um, and so we're hoping that we can manage that with the last midnight. Uh, uh, when I heard the song, it's a beautiful song. 
Um, a lot of passion in it, isn't there? And it, anger, actually. Uh, uh, and anger. And I wondered whether it would be worth exploring the kind of anger that is not destructive outwardly, but is inwardly so. Um, and that it may be as much about someone's self-destruction as de de in, as in the show. Well, the um, witch destroying disappears them. at that point, doesn't she? In fact, she does. She does, and that's in that's in the piece as yeah. well. I mean, that's obviously yeah. in Into the Woods, but maybe focusing on that area and doing something quieter. I listened to a couple of very interesting versions. Um, Vanessa Williams, of course, quite quite different, almost like a lullaby than. Um, the amazing Bernadette Peters. Uh, I think it is a song that can take reinterpretation. Take reinterpretation. The difficulty then becomes um, the specifics of the text, which refer to beans and giants and witches, and uh, and really knowing what that means in your version. If it's if you don't mean the real thing, yes. <laughs> what do you mean? What is? Um, what are the How allegorical do they become for you? Yeah. Yeah, I think really being quite specific in in your thinking. So we'll see if that gets achieved. It's, it's I'm looking to I'm, try. I'm, you've got me intrigued already. I'm coming to see the show next week, well, so um, mm. I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to this one particularly now. Well, I don't know. I, um, maybe you should come the third week and see, <laughs> see oh, whether it's going to achieve more by than then. once. Oh. But but once again, you've raised a very interesting point. And sometimes a very good example of how to do this, integrated score with plot. Mm. So the songs fit very firmly in um, the show that they're in at that point and have a plot-specific function quite often. Mm. Therefore, how easy is it, is it to detach a sometime song for a cabaret where it has to stand alone, even if you're doing the old-fashioned thing of uh, explaining where it comes in a plot? You know, I, I think, actually, he does... Uh quite a lot of work that can stand alone or maybe that's just the ones that I've heard but things like Sorry Grateful from Company Being Alive I mean the classic mm. you know 2 a.m. New York piano bar everybody drunk <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> leaning over and trying to grasp some reason to, <laughs> to be alive the next day I mean um, I think there is a lot Send in the Clowns is mysterious in the show so um, Less so, I guess, for an actress to sing, but it's obviously for the public, there's, yes. there's something that, it, because it's been recorded so many times, anyone can whistle. All of these, I think, are um, you, you can remove fair, fairly yeah. easily. And, and Has there been any that you think are a bit of a challenge? You, I mean, you've already spoken about... Uh, I think the gun song's difficult, because yes. although... Um, it doesn't need to be about the specific characters in, in Assassins. It's it's still obviously about people obsessed with um, picking up a gun and killing people, which is un unfortunately um, but timely. Even, but once again, well, there is always that. But once again, I suppose it's the emotional element of that, isn't it? Because sometimes um, those songs, uh, the anger of the Assassins is from hatred, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's from obsessive love. Mm. And sometimes that hatred actually comes from a thwarted love or thwarted anything. You know, mm. they, it's not hate doesn't appear on its own. Mm. It stems from somewhere else, and sometimes the original emotion can infuse it. So once again, you're back in that situation where you have more than one emotion, and you're yes. able to bring all these things. Is it out. also a lonely visitor? It it is seldom, indeed, seldom, seldom a lonely actually. visitor. <laughs> but that's true. I mean, it, it is. I mean, hate, whilst it can overpower, mm. is very rarely um, the only flavour in the palate. I suppose. It was. Mm. Oh, we'll have to remember that when we do that. I'll bring that up at the next rehearsal. Oh, well, right now we're just trying to get the notes right. But uh, I think that's um, it's, it, it would be quite nice if we each had... Well, actually, we were working on it today and each of us had rather different approach to our gun obsession. <laughs> <laughs> but it, as well yeah. as being an odd song, it's really quite beautiful, which is another reason that it's great. Well, the song the itself has texture, doesn't it? I mean, it's, mm. And as you said, it's, it's, it's a four-part harmony, which is uh, when right is... Always a joy for the ear. Yes, and when wrong, it's really dreadful. Yes. <laughs> As I know from our recent rehearsals, but we're going to make it beautiful. Oh, uh, it, it will yeah. be beautiful. It will. Um, the lovely. There won't be trumpets from anyone can whistle. I guess. Now well. was that? Now I think that was. I think that was cut from the original production or something. Was it in the one? Uh, yes, that was here. No, no. I mean the original production. I mean it was mm. certainly. I mean it's always included now. Yes. Um, but I think when it ran originally in America, you know, the, the, the sort of the. How surprising! Because it's yes. such a rousing and singable one. I'm sure that's the one that was. Um, 
There was a song that's a real surprise to find that was cut from the score. I, I always think it's that one, but maybe wrong. It has been known. Mm-hmm. Musical talk. Yes, I'm Tom Littler and I'm directing this production of Anyone Can Whistle. Now, we met in the street on the way to seeing Stephen Sondheim a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about the theme, uh, what you saw here. And I, when I sat down and thought about it, I thought you were absolutely right. It's been misunderstood for years, uh, in my view, and I think in yours. So, for you, what is the theme that's being uncovered and unravelled in Anyone Can Whistle? What we're working towards is, is exploring a theme of freedom versus oppression and that's what I'm really interested in in the show in the sort of in the first third and in the last third that's very public and very political it's about political freedom it's a highly repressive state which doesn't allow people to do what they want to do or say what they want to say it's able to imprison people and and as the as the show progresses it becomes more and more hard line until you get to the section called the cookie chase or Cora's chase uh, where people are arbitrarily rounded up off the streets and and flung into jail and all of that is accompanied by sort of music which is pastiching Strauss waltzes so it's this fabulous uh, contrast between the musical form and what's actually being talked about which is so typical of Sondheim the middle third is the the story of Faye and Hapgood and so you could think, well, this is very peculiar because what's this romantic story doing in the middle of this political drama? But actually, I think it's about exactly the same thing because Faye, who is a highly repressed woman, um, is being set up against Hapgood, who is quite the opposite of that. Um, a liberal free thinker. Absolutely, a liberal free thinker and somebody... An uh, yes, and somebody who enjoys sex and who enjoys living for the moment. And, and that's his whole creed, really. She says, do you think there are any miracles? And he says, yes, I think there's one. It's called being alive, which is a theme that mm. does crop up more than once in yeah, sometimes work. I think he's um, it elsewhere. Yeah, I think being alive maybe once or twice explored. So I think it's very consistent what the show is about, actually. There's something about it, I suppose, because it can seem a bit zany that, um, I don't know, I've, I've never seen another production of it, so I can't judge, but... Um, but maybe it encourages people to do zany productions or something, I don't know. I think actually what it needs is a, is a simplicity and quite a strong through line uh, and a focus. And also, I think it's the one of his works which is most explicitly influenced by Kurt Weill and by Brecht. So that's something that, um, I mean, whether it will come through... Fascism, in fact. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's true. And so I, whether that comes through really explicitly in our production or not, I don't know. But we've certainly been thinking about it a lot, that, um, you know, this is, a, this is an American response about, I suppose, about 15 years later to the music of Kurt Weill that was being brought into Broadway in the 50s. Mm. Um, when he lived in America. Absolutely, absolutely. So that whole, uh, that whole Lady in the Dark and all the rest of it, particularly The City of Mahagoni, which is a show that features a corrupt ruler and her henchmen who set up a town in the middle of America, which attracts all sorts of sinners and disreputable people. Um, I mean, that, that, that Lady Mayor thing, I mean, whether it is a direct influence or not, is very useful for me as a way of sort of referencing back. So there's something about that highly theatrical style which we're sort of trying to tap into. So it's quite it's quite un-Broadway-ish, I suppose, in a way. Although it does have these, as you say, musical theatre precedents, because there's also Let Me Cake by George Gershwin. That's right, 30s, that's right. Books by Moss Hart, I think. That's right. It's very much the upper, upper Lawrence of his generation. Yes, no, that's right. Yeah, no, and it's, it's, it doesn't stand completely alone. I think there's something about its political engagement, which is rare. It does happen in musical theatre, of course it does, but... But, it's, but they're unusual musicals that really plug into a political situation because it's not usually considered that sort of a form. But I think um, in this case it is. You know, there's, a, there's, there's the rise of a sort of totalitarian state and then an anarchist called Hapgood uh, comes into their midst and attempts to instigate a coup in the number called Simple. So that's what, that's what we've been exploring. I also 
because when we were speaking before this, uh, you said that a lot of people are mistaking it for being about sanity and insanity, which is a, a very because it's overtly a, a, a group of people with mental health difficulties or lunatics as they were rather less charmingly called you know, or cookies in fact it is mm, mm. Um, but in fact it's about connection and disconnection from society in some senses sometimes imposed by the state or by mental health rules or whatever and sometimes from the self which is Faye's problem that she yeah. has cut herself off from how yeah. she feels and yeah yeah I don't think um, it's particularly engaged with um, the nature of sanity or insanity um, I think that that's there it's an ingredient but um, I don't think it's to the fore you know um, if it were you know if it were a perfume it would be a note that you do, that, that is not very present you know sort of thing um, it's not a dominant bit in the chord that is anyone can whistle so I think um, yeah it's there but it's not a, it's for me it's not a big deal and for me it's extremely ambiguous as to who the cookies are in the first place um, which is Arthur Lawrence's drive isn't it I think so I think so I think so yeah I, um, for me um, they could be within uh, uh, the umbrella of an oppressive regime they could be anyone they might be gypsies they might be Jews they might be people who are gay they might be people who are political dissidents uh, they might be mad, um, but I think that's only one of several things that they might be. They are social undesirables, and what it's called is a home for the socially pressured. Um, and uh, and certainly, as the piece goes on, at least in our production, I think it, I think it will very much feel that there's a strongly political element to to why they're there. I mean, they're not clanking about in in chains when they oh, first no. appear or anything, but um, but they're but they're not thrilled to be there either. No. Be more than Iron Bars to make a prison, although, yeah. as Bugs Bunny immortally said, they sure help. <laughs> now, can I ask you a question? Last year you did a fantastic production of uh, Saturday Night Live Sondheim, and that Thank was you the very last much. Sondheim, if you like. This is the failed Sondheim, because <laughs> it, well, it only what, nine, nine performances, nine I think, shows. in its original run. Nine shows. So why did you pick this one? I loved it. Um, oh, that was a very good answer. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's very simple for me why I do shows. I mean, um, I have to think that they are achievable within the spaces that we're going to do them in. Um, and I have to love them. And, I, and this is one that I love. It's, so, so it's very simple for me. Um, I was fascinated by the boldness of it, by the fact that the most extreme uh, things in terms of plot and theme are set to wildly juxtaposed music like the cookie chase like simple all those sorts of sequences um, it offers three uh, four really extraordinary lead roles um, for Alastair Robbins who's playing Shub who emerges I think in this production very strongly it's a very powerful dark presence and for Izzy Van Randrick who's playing Cora um, and for Rosie Craig and, and David Ricardo Pierce as Faye and Hapgood um, I, you know those four roles are all very um exciting and interesting and challenging at every turn and totally different dynamics in each case yeah absolutely absolutely and um but equally there's this there's this uh cora is surrounded by this group of uh, not one but three councillors uh, each of whom is very powerful often very dark in their own way um and leo andrew and carl moffat are bringing huge qualities to those too um and, and then, um, although it is this huge show, which really ought to be done with about 100 people, um, the fact that we're doing it with a cast of 13 or 14 has actually, for me, become a huge help because it's meant that everybody has to double as every one. There are about six or seven people who have to be playing um, so-called cookies one moment and townspeople who are not cookies the next moment. Um, and this they do by turning round. You know, um, there's no, or, 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 um, or just crossing the stage. There's no costume change. There's no um, sign holding up or anything like that. I mean, hey, I'm saying this before preview, so it might all change by the time you see it next. But you're relying on an intelligent audience. I am to some extent, yeah, and a, and a suspension of disbelief and 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 buying into that um, that version of the story. That's what I. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, and actually, having uh, having few resources in terms of people is a great advantage because it because it makes you see the whole thing more clearly. You know, if you've got five people who are one group of people one moment and another group of people the next, you know, you can't 
have flashy staging, you can't have people filing on and off. You've got to think it through, and they have to think it through, uh, with real clarity. Um, and, uh, and that's what they're doing at the moment, actually, and that's what I'm very pleased with, because they're all playing the story all the time and aiming for maximum clarity all the time. It's a beautiful conceit actually anyway I think the idea of them not just turning around or moving across because they are the same people because if the whole thing is about who do we categorise to oppress then in fact actually the line is almost entirely, well it is arbitrary that's the argument being made I think and then if you've got people actually sitting on both sides just by the flick of a wrist or a movement or whatever then actually you're sort of physically underpinning the, the theme of the, or one of the themes of the piece. No that's my idea that, yeah. that um, that they can, that 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 there is no difference between one group of people and the other group of people, particularly, and therefore by having the same actors playing them, uh, that becomes rather more powerful actually, because you you start to tap into that from quite an early stage. Tell me, you've once again, because last year when you did Saturday Night, you you said to me that it was the first time you'd used actor players, mm, mm. and this is also an actor player piece, mm, so you obviously. Mm decided that this can open up new doors to you. Sure. What, what does it bring to this particular piece? It's about power um, in this piece, the use of actor musicianship. Um, I mean, we're, we're still working on it, but um, I think conducting will emerge as something of a theme. Um, and um, who people are playing for and whether they're playing negatively or positively, whether they're choosing to support something um, or whether they're being forced to play... Um, so, Only um, one brings harmony in both its <laughs> musical and social sense. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So there are definitely scenes where, um, where people are, are very explicitly being commanded to play. So it's music in a sort of Soviet sense, I suppose, <laughs> as, a, as a tool of both expression and oppression. Um, it's also, this piece is divided quite clearly into two kinds of music. Um, and, uh, and they are what sometimes calls pure music or true music, by which he means the music he writes Fay and Hapgood, um, and fake music, or indeed nightclub music, he sometimes calls it, which is Cora's music. She's more cabaret-ish anyway, isn't It's she? much more cabaret-ish, and in our production there is, a sort, there is a sort of streak of cabaret in the design, actually, um, which hopefully will just point that up a little bit. Um, but when you actually see people playing, rather than them being buried in a pit or up in the sky or whatever they, wherever they are, um, you can see those different types of music being played, you know, because sometimes it's more showy um, and sometimes it's much more discreet. Um, so hopefully something about the visual impact of actually seeing musicians will help the audience understand that contrast in the styles. Once again, you're putting visual keys in all the way through, the clever and subtle ones, rather than, as you say, the overt uh, costume changes or anything like that. It's, um, you're, you're letting... A, it's almost like a collage of clues. So it's not just the text and the music and the performance, but actually there's a lot more coming across. Presumably that's reflected in lighting and sound. And I the, hope so, yeah. Well. I hope so. I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into the theatre this week and um, this coming week and, uh, and, and exploring all of those elements. Um, because inevitably in the rehearsal room uh, you, you know you're focused on um, performances and emotional journeys and and also the technicalities of people getting on and off stage and all the rest of it um, uh, so I'm really looking forward to, to and there's a fantastic creative team behind it including uh, Morgan Large designing the set who's um, just done a beautiful set for Cat on a Hot Tin Roof the Novello and, um, and I think all of their work will lend a lot to it um, and, and, and emphasise that feeling of theatricality um, and occasional fakeness um, and artifice. I mean, after all, um, I don't want to spoil the plot for anyone, but uh, uh, the nature of the miracle which kickstarts the plot is somewhat dubious. <laughs> so it's rather nice to see. Um, it's quite nice to see the artifice behind it. You know, so if we, the audience, can see the construction that is making the miracle work, then, then that's echoing what's actually going on on stage. Final question then. This production, for you, the biggest challenge you've had to surmount? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, it's always a funny rhythm rehearsing these things because the first couple of weeks are extremely dominated by music. Mm. Um, because it's actor musicians and um, 
Until it's learnt, there isn't a whole lot you can do. You can't bolt it on later, can you? No, no so you sort of slightly have to rehearse it back to front, where you might spend uh, the first week um, talking about character or whatever, um, exploring journeys and all the rest of it, um, as you would for a play. Um, for this, you have to get those technical aspects sorted early. Um, so it's so the so the the challenges have been partly uh, uh, my patience, um, uh, resist, honest, resisting man. resisting talking too much in the first couple of weeks of rehearsal and letting um, uh, Tom Atwood, the music director, get on with his job. Um, and so it's really in the third and fourth weeks that I've been able to to get really involved and. Uh, and beyond sort of simply staging it, really start to get involved with it and work in a lot of detail, which has been lovely. Um, but now they're very technically on it, so I'm able to do that. So it's been partly that. It's been looking for narrative and thematic clarity wherever possible. That's been the mission. Um, and uh, fingers crossed, touch wood, I hope uh, we've found some of that. Um, because it's... Um, it's a piece that's sometimes been criticised in the past for being diffuse and I think um, for me anyway um, we've been aiming for a lot of focus in this production and I think we're finding it finding a golden thread of both tonality and narrative absolutely it, yeah yeah Tom as always intelligent and fascinating I don't think I can ask anything <laughs> more so thank you thank very you, much thank you thank you very much Thus. Musical talk. And here's actor David Ricardo Pierce talking about Saturday Night. Uh, my name is David Ricardo Pierce and I play Gene. I'm going to go straight in with the Sondheim question. Yep. You've done Sondheim before, I think. I have, yeah. Now, what was that? Sweeney Todd. Well, I've, I've done a couple of Sondheims actually. I did Company when I was uh, younger and then I did Sweeney Todd when I was, oh, when I, know, when I was a bit older, I did it in, at the Watermill Theatre. And then we toured, and then we went into the West End. We did a, a run at the Trafalgar Studios, and then we did a run at the New Ambassadors. And who uh, were you in some new times? Anthony, I played, yeah, the, so the a, sailor. Yeah, a significant um, character. Yeah, good, good, good you, part. You're right on at the beginning, aren't you? Right on at the beginning, yeah, and then r- right on at the end. He doesn't, he's one of the ones that doesn't get killed. So it's yeah, quite, well done. <laughs> it's nice, yeah. <laughs> um, so you've obviously got a, you know, you and Sondheim go way back. We go way, well, he came to see that, Sweeney, actually. Um, so we, we met him, and it, we had a chat. He was lovely and very, very nice about the production and just very sort of sweet encouraging guy actually just you know you kind of vaguely expect him to be because you hear all these stories about sometimes sitting in re- dress rehearsals and tutting and going oh my god what, this is horrible I, I can't hear that lyric or, and um, composer diva yeah yeah and he you know he wasn't sort of like that at all actually with us and he was just very very uh, he, oh, actually he took it out they did it on Broadway as well for, for a bit so he, he obviously really was behind it but yeah he's a nice bloke <laughs> so bearing in mind you've got that Sondheim history you yeah. obviously know the canon shall we say how does it feel do you feel the weight of the history of this show which of course is the the odd one in the sometime range isn't it it's the lost one yeah uh, I don't actually because um, I think because it's never really been done in a, a big scale production where it's it's sort of where it's never really done very well mm. so um, th- there haven't been many performances that, that are, are, are like legendary mm. so in a way I don't like it's like a blank canvas and that's quite exciting with a sun time because you don't have any model to, to, to try and sort of replicate or move away from because I remember when I did Sweeney um, the, the last person who, who did, had done it in London was Adrian Lester who's one of my heroes and I was lucky enough to he's to done very well for him. himself hasn't he yeah he's done he's done alright yeah, he's, he's, yeah and he um, he's because I think he's brilliant I was kind of. I didn't. It's not like I felt weighed down by it, but I did feel like there was a kind of like a standard of like, you know, of where that character should be at. So it was. So there, but there, that isn't there with Gene really. He's he's kind of he's yours to to do what you want with, and that's nice. 
but so you could be the model that other people in the future are going to be looking to. <laughs> well, yeah, possibly. I, I don't know. I mean, it sort of depends. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really like to think about that, actually. Um, but Just I, say yes and move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent answer. So how well did you know the piece? I mean, are you enough of a Sondheim fan to have heard the score before you no, join no, the project? No. So. I mean, I'm a Sondheim fan, but not so avidly like I don't know all of his musicals actually uh, like I, Assassins I don't know Passion I don't really know um, I know if, like Into the Woods and Little yes. Night Music and Company and, and obviously the, the ones that I've very, very You're working on too. Yeah, yeah but not I'm not a sort of like an avid fan I don't have all his soundtracks at home <laughs> so coming to this one what, I mean Gene's a good character Gene's the central character yeah He's very aspirational. He's always, you know, he's always looking to the next thing. He's got ideas. Yeah. Whether they pay off is another matter, of course, and the plot reveals that. Mm-hmm. But, um, but he also has this romantic side, which ultimately triumphs over his aspirational. Well put. Yes. Yeah. How do you that, that battle within him? Mm. How do you bring that out and keep him sympathetic? Because he is a sympathetic character. Well, he he is a sympathetic character. I think because he's so impulsive, actually, because he's not. I think the characters that annoy you are like plotter. <laughs> devious characters and there's nothing devious about Gene he's very open and frank um, and he doesn't lie to people he doesn't trick people he just does stuff because he's because he, he feels threatened or because he feels humiliated or because somebody's putting him down so he does he, he's like a kid basically he does things to prove himself and um, he's just he's playing with bigger toys like all of his <laughs> friends savings and you know people's cars and stuff so um, yeah I think he's likeable in that sense because be, because he's just he's, he's a fairly open character but at the same time he does do some really selfish I mean he's, he's massively selfish but not intentionally selfish mm, thoughtless selfish exactly yeah now you get quite a you, you get a good chunk of the good songs if I may say Gene sings class yeah, which is uh, which the second is, number isn't it which is the second number of the show yeah which which is um, which is which is his dreams you know him telling his, his, I want his friends exactly it's, it's his it's like his anthem you know that this is my belief system and then he and then he sings a bit in um, it's not Love's a Bond it's a moment with you it's like a version of Love's a Bond and they kind of they sing that along to the record and then he sings a bit of So Many People and then he sings What More Do I Need so he's got some lovely sort of quite revealing songs yeah class yeah your, your take on him, is he someone who genuinely understands class or is he someone who doesn't quite get it? Do you think he, to the upper set, that he so desperately wishes to be part of, the 400? Mm. Do you, when he talk, calls the, uh, the... You have great knowledge of this show, by the way. I'm, so, I'm very oh, impressed. Oh, it's awfully kind. No, that's, no but it's very, it's very detailed. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe, I mean, in answer to that, I, I believe that he does know what he's talking about, actually. and Because he because he passes himself off so well you know he does successfully crash balls um he he, people buy it you know the guy at the end he buys that he's part of the upper classes i think he's really really has done his research and i think as a person he's kind of got that confidence about him that the upper classes have even though he's he's not he hasn't been born into that society um i don't know how long he'd last at a dinner party for example (laughs) with that but but in terms of knowing the sort of the, the facade of class I think he does get it pretty well I think he's observed it quite carefully yeah. he's, he's, got the, he's got the basics I think so definitely yeah. oh, right forgive me because I'm going to ask you two questions about or three questions about relationships here the relationship with Helen is interesting because at first he certainly thinks that she is what he's after mm-hmm. classy beautiful and rich yeah. um, but the relationship with Celeste as well and uh, Helena uh, who plays Helen was saying that it took the cast a while to work out that uh, Jean and Celeste are not brother and sister. In which case, what do you think that relationship is? Finally, is because he's got much more ambition than his four flat bush chums, mm. shall we say, Artie and the gang. Um, how do you think he comes? I mean, he's, he's still part of that group, and yet he's so much more sophisticated than that group. I mean, mm. I'm sorry, I've asked quite a lot of questions, yeah. but I just, how do you look at the emotional nexus that he's in? It's um, mm. by which I mean. The different lines. He's he's got lots of different relationships with lots of different people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's able to sustain them all, even though they all come from totally different yeah. backgrounds and uh, have yeah. atti- different attitudes. Yeah, yeah. They're quite, you know. Celeste is a very caustic character. Yeah. Well, I just I, I think in answer to that, I suppose it, it sort of goes back to what I was saying about him being sympathetic, because he I think because he's such a kind of honest, open, responsive guy, I think he can banter with his Brooklyn mates. He can 
do the slightly more sophisticated chat, especially with Helen at the beginning, and then you know with Helen when she reveals herself. With Celeste, he's kind of he's quick enough and he's he's forward enough to be able to. And also, actually, that the the relationship with Celeste is an interesting one because they are like brother and sister, but. I mean, it's just they must have known each other for a long, long time. I think, and they're not actually brother and sister, but, but they're, they're they are very, grown very into each other, aren't they? yeah, they're yeah. very old friends, and they and they seem to just really have a fondness for each other, which is not at all sexual, just <laughs> kind of a, just a, a platonic thing. Where they, I think, Celeste understands him quite well, um, and she gets, she sort of knows about the the society that he wants to be in more than his friends. So he's got that in common with her, and and she's kind of the one. That that it could probably have a good sit down chat with him and say you, you're going over the top. But yeah, I, I guess he's just one of those people who, who who happens he just has the common touch. He happens to be able to get on with a lot of different people, and his charm just sort of carries him through a lot of it. I think. So he's, yes, charm charm is an excellent. Word. I think I think that's yeah. I think you've probably got it absolutely on the, on the nail there because it's, he has a, a social affability which opens him up to all, which I suppose is how those doors in society, which are so often closed, yeah. are open to him. Yeah, yeah, Not just yeah. observation, the fact he's got enough underneath yeah. to be able to carry it off, personality. And enough front to him, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And how many Brooks suits do you personally own? <laughs> Not one. Not one? Not one, oh, right. me, me myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have a Brooks suit. Just, just to conclude then, if I may, um, mm. how did you join the project? Uh, I was approached by the, the production team um, a couple of months ago. I, I think they, they sort of know my work a bit and they thought I'd be right and we just had to sit down chat and talk about the project and I had to look at it and uh, listen to it and I just I kind of well, I got quite excited about the project really because to do a song time that hasn't been done is, is really exciting because for me I think he is the most interesting musical theatre writer around. Oh, yes. I, I, you know, Jason Robin Brown is, is, is similar, but I kind of yeah, I don't know his work quite as well. I, and I'm sure there Sondheim, are other people. But and Sondheim was their first reading. Yeah, yes. exactly. For, for me, it's, it's kind of a great opportunity. Oh, and you may meet him again, who knows? <laughs> he does quite often come over and see. Well, it depends, really. I, you know, if he's over for a couple of reasons, he might pop yeah. in. Yeah. But we'll, we'll yeah. see. I, d- I don't know if he'll do the fight just for German Street. Best of luck. Thank you very much. Nice That's, to meet you. Thank you. Hey, my name is Stuart Fleming. I am Associate Musical Director on Company at the Fringe. Now, Company is um, an early Stephen Sondheim, 1970, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in some ways it's the first one that really sounds like a Sondheim show. Yes. The funny mm-hmm. thing happens to, on the, uh, to Forum, which is also here, mm-hmm. but the music uh, isn't quite the same. Mm-hmm. From your point of view, mm-hmm. as someone who's sort of um, musical director, innately collected with the score, mm-hmm. rather than the physical actor's performances, mm-hmm. when someone says we're going to do a song time, do you think hooray, or do you mm-hmm. think, oh, bother, that's uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of fiddling? Uh, uh, I look, I look forward to it. I think, I think it's great material. It's, it's intelligent material, and it's, it's put together very well. I mean, the man doesn't put anything in by chance. It's all planned out, whether it be from the text or a dramatic purpose, or everything comes together. Literally, everything comes together and fuses and makes this one cohesive performance, which is it. it maybe, maybe appeals to the more intellectual audience that some of it's quite heightened but it's it's great material it really is does that include the score because I'm actually thinking more because I know obviously he does uh, mm-hmm. the book, um, lyrics and music it's, it's the content the content of the score I mean as far as harmony is concerned he uses some very rich and almost on the tonality scale sometimes it's quite dissonant in a lot of places which you don't necessarily get in a lot of popular musical theatre uh, but the, the score is, I would say is slightly slightly more complex than a lot of the scores out there and I think he's known for that and respected for that Is it hard for you as someone you know conducting leading the mm-hmm. group in front of you is, is, is it harder to do than others uh, I mean like, a challenge yes of course but not, not necessarily harder to conduct than other shows but I, I would say that the piecing and the putting it together for example the overture at the start yes. that is pretty complex you've got all these different parts moving in and out of one another uh, the preparation for it's harder but I wouldn't say the, the actual once it's on its feet the conducting is any, any trickier Oh really? So in some senses it, it, it matches what, mm-hmm. what you'd expect mm-hmm. elsewhere. Is there anything surprising in the score by Stephen Sondheim, or this, this score in particular? Um, so you think, actually, why is he doing that? Does it puzzle you at any level? I don't think so. I think, I think you could read into it for ages and ages and ages. It's just, it, I mean, it's such a compelling, a compelling story about that 30-odd single, single Bobby. I mean, it's, it's something that we're all 
with, with all you that experienced or were likely to experience that sort of bachelor lifestyle, and it's, it, it depicts that life. It depends at different times for different people. Yeah, yes, you're mm-hmm. right. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. But forgive me, when you see the, the notes on the page, mm-hmm. I'm just wondering, um, and I, I t- I'll give you a good example. Mm-hmm. I was talking to somebody who recently conducted The Grand Duke, which is mm-hmm. the last Gilbert and Sullivan, mm-hmm. you know, totally different mm-hmm. century, let alone um, mm-hmm. generation. And they were saying that what's really, there's stuff in there that Sullivan does which you don't expect Sullivan to do mm-hmm. naturally. Mm-hmm. They say it's, it's almost like he's playing with his own game. Mm-hmm. Um, and not confusing, but doing mm-hmm. things that just seem slightly different mm-hmm. or odd, it was described. Mm-hmm. I wonder, I mean, this is an early sometime, but, mm-hmm. but it is, if you like, in, I'm not putting this very well, mm-hmm. is the dissonance, recognised dissonance, or is it sufficiently unusual, even to a, an audience which has had 42 years to get used to it? I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. I would say it's... it's it's just Sondheim. You just know when you listen to it that that's that's who it's by. Uh, I mean, for example, it's the way Sondheim. Sondheim's got his own style, but he can also write stylistically. He can pastiche, it, yeah, pastiche absolutely. absolutely. And it's I mean, a little night music is a perfect example of that. It's, com- it's polar opposite from Company. Company's got this sort of seventies sort of clavichord jazz type yes. feel to it, and then a little a bit night of music. Stuff going mm-hmm. on, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that scored in it, but it's just. I don't. I, th- I think it's, it's Sondheim is Sondheim, in all honesty. Well, I'm going to press you a little bit mm-hmm. because you said you can tell it's Sondheim. How can you tell it's Sondheim? What are the, what are the hallmarks? I think it's the, the harmony that he uses. It's, it's the way in which he uses the notes and the way in which he, he puts the voices together. It's the phrasing marks, all these sorts of things. It's, if, if you've done a lot of. Maybe to the, to the newcomer, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have a sense of this is slightly different, but. To someone who's been doing it, you need to know what to look for, but you can tell. You, you do know. Have you looked at other Sondheim scores? I mean, mm-hmm. does, does it feel like it's in a progression? Does it feel like an early Sondheim, or does he come fully formed? Mm, I think... I wouldn't necessarily say it's, it, it feels like an early Sondheim. I think, I think Sondheim breaks across the board. I think everything he's written is, is very... Uh, what's the best way to put it? It's, it, it, I mean, you, you take Sunday in the Park with George, for example. Now that's the Which later. Was your show last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I was nothing to do with no, that. Scottish Academy. But uh, it, I mean, you, t- you take that, or even Merrily we roll along. Yeah. That's another one that was written near enough, roughly the same sort of time as Company. Uh, maybe it's, about, it's about ten years later. It's eighty-one. Was it eighty-one? I thought it was. I thought it was earlier than that. Uh, but I mean, you could you could swap them, and it, it, it's just get that sort of sound. You just you just know when you're listening to Sondheim. That's. I mean, I don't disagree with you as mm-hmm. a hand. I mean, I, I, I discover them from the, from the mm-hmm. albums, and uh, mm-hmm. I didn't know the order they came in when you're first sort of mm-hmm. stepping your toe in the world of Sondheim. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, they, they did sound um, as, from the same pen, mm-hmm. although you wouldn't say they were at all the same. Mm-hmm. Um, very curious. Mm-hmm. I've got to ask you the big question mm-hmm. that I want to ask. You, you, you're delivered with the paper for you to look at. Mm-hmm. You've opened you open the book, and there you are on mm-hmm. all the notes. It's a Sondheim score. It's obviously a Sondheim score. Who is responsible for that Sondheim sound? Is it Sondheim or is it Tunic? Are you actually looking at a Tunic work? Mm. <laughs> no one's going to sue, so... <laughs> There's, oh, that's the question. I, I don't know how to answer have you that. Ever seen un, have you ever seen a, a non-Tunic Sondheim orchestration? I'm desperate to hear one. Not because I don't think Jonathan Tunic is anything other than a genius, mm-hmm. but I'd love to know how Sondheim would sound if you were doing it as a Salvation Army band. Or, yeah, that's... that's that's interesting. That's throwing it out there, isn't yes. it? Uh, well, I asked a question, and no one's had the answer yet. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's maybe why I'm struggling. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. That's 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 a hard question. Can you spot the hand of an orchestrator in a score, not just for some time and you know? Uh, um, yeah, the, I mean, the, I think the different arrangers and different orchestrators have their own tricks and their own ways of working the harmony and. Stylistic features within within things. It's. But did you start to separate that? Because you were talking about you mm-hmm. know sometimes harmonies, mm-hmm. but we're also talking about tunics or, mm-hmm. or whoever in this mm-hmm. case. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, th- I think. I think I think they all have their own trademarks in a way. I think they all they all. They all have their own tools, and it's. Uh, the more that they do, I think their their tools and their sort of trademarks follow through all their work, like it does with everyone's. I mean, there's there's certain ways that I'll conduct, there's certain ways that I play that is of me. So it's, it's that sort of thing. It's a bit. 
I'm going to talk about your conducting style because mm-hmm. today I had great fun watching you as much as I enjoyed watching the performance today mm-hmm. because uh, you're very lively. Mm-hmm. You know, you, 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 the baton's in your left hand. Right? Yes, I have left hand. I get, yes. I get this all the time. <laughs> well, it's interesting that people stop singing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're, you, know, you bounce up and down on your feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and also you seem to sing all the lyrics, even yeah. when uh, some of the walk-down music, when there's no one singing, mm-hmm. I noticed. Mm-hmm. I mean, is this your way of getting into you know, living the score and transmuting it for your... Uh, I, th- I think it's a bit of that, and I think it's also a bit of support for the cast so that they know that I am with them if yeah. I'm singing along with them. It's, it's not necessarily that they need to look up and think, all oh, right, that's the lyric at this point in time. I think it's just more of a team thing. That, that, that's, that's what I try to put out there. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm going to say this honestly, I'm a words man more than a music man, so mm-hmm. you can bamboozle me as much as you like, because mm-hmm. I won't know any better. Mm-hmm. But um, how precise an art is it? You know, forgive me, because you've... You're in charge of the orchestra, mm-hmm. but you have also got to keep the performers with you, as mm-hmm. you quite rightly said. So mm-hmm. you, these are the methods you've been doing it mm-hmm. by being active, by being seen on the peripheral vision, mm-hmm. presumably, and things like that. Mm-hmm. How much responsibility falls on your shoulders if an actor loses the tempo? Do you bring the tempo to them, or are they expected to come to you? These are the layman's questions, you understand. The, yeah. Um, I need to watch what I say here. It's, I think I think it depends on opinions. Figuratively, no one specific. <laughs> ult- ultimately, I mean, the conductor should follow the dramatic intention of the text and the intention of the actor. But there's also a bit of come and go. The the con- it's symbiosis in some sense. Yeah, mm-hmm, absolutely. Or synergy, I, as everyone likes to say these yeah. days, in management. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, th- I, I, think, I think it's a bit, of a, a bit of a team game. It's known when you're leading and when they're leading, and just there's that sort of sympathetic relationship that's going on. Uh, I, would, I would say that's... that's Presumably that must all be based on trust, you know, the regular rehearsals. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I would say so. I would say so. There's a, there needs to be that sort of team, team player motion, that, that sort of mood going on within the cast. Uh, because if, if it's not there, you don't have anything. It's... It's, to be true, truthful, it's like someone coming in and conducting it dry that doesn't know the cast, there needs to be some sort of energy or previous sort of sense of relationship, I would say. Do you find, and I hope you don't mind me asking this, no, no. you know, forgive me, it's sometimes it's also deceptive. Mm-hmm. People coming to a Sondheim sound, um, mm-hmm. you know, if they come to company for the first time, they'll say, oh, this sounds like a 70s thing, and the orchestration mm-hmm. back set up, and, mm-hmm. you know, it could be a. A, a single from that period mm-hmm. uh, like any time from about 1967 to about 1975 mm-hmm. I should think in terms of th- some of the orchestration and the musical instruments mm-hmm. that were used or invoked um, but people would hear it a little bit bitty in mm-hmm. some senses and yet there's a really rich musical bed for the performance mm-hmm. it seems to me which I don't think people spot mm-hmm. for example I think I listen to the music Obviously, a song is the words mm-hmm. and the music mm-hmm. in its entirety. But when and people absorb what's going on the stage because they're also trying to pick out what the actors are mm-hmm. doing and draw out the action mm-hmm. and learn, learn the lesson of the song. So they sometimes miss some of the elements, and it seems to me the first elements which are missed or mm-hmm. conglomerated mm-hmm. are those elements of the score. Mm-hmm. So for today, during um, there's one particular song. It was um, when another hundred people. Yes. There's mm-hmm. a lovely bit of um, scoring in that. Mm-hmm. Where the you know Bobby baby Bobby Booba mm-hmm. stuff is mm-hmm. going on over that, which I've never heard mm-hmm. before, uh, and you only I think you only ever pick these things mm-hmm. up in live performance, which mm-hmm. is one of the joys. Of it. Well, I, I think yeah. I think that's one of the trademarks of Song Time. That he, I mean, his, his music can stand alone in the text and. The melodies can stand alone, which is the intelligent way of writing. That is, I mean, there's often in song time you've got probably three melodies going on mm. at, at, at the peak. So it's a proper integrated mm. score yeah. at every level. Absolutely, but the, the, the other thing is the melody and the accompaniment both complement each other, but there's often no support for the voice at all. That The voice has to be learned... It complements it very, very well, but the voice, the, the vocal part of the melody needs to be known inside out. Yes, if you took the words away from the ladies who lunch, for example, mm-hmm. you just have some kind of salsa sound, mm-hmm. wouldn't you, really? Because I was even, listening to it. Uh, even a better example is Not Getting Married Today, when... Um, Which is his Gilbert and Sullivan moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when... I'm trying to think of the character's name. I'm, I was Amy? G- going to use... Paul. Amy, Amy and Paul, sorry, that's that. Amy and Paul are singing this sort of polyphonic yes. thing going on. At, at the end, I mean, there's... None of it is supported by the accompaniment. You've got the little, 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 and harmonically it's changing and progressing as we go move forward. But at the end, they both come and do their duet, and there's no support there. That's that's creative writing. Does that worry you as the <laughs> musical director? Yes, 
At the start it does, but <laughs> one, we, once you set it, you set it, and yeah. normally it's fine. Normally so it's, it's okay. almost that thing about you know, pointing, a river down, uh, pointing a boat down the river and just hoping it doesn't hit the side. You know, yeah. You've done as much as you mm-hmm. can. Pretty much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But no, I mean, you, you, you normally see it's getting into these bits. It's the transitions between the blessed this day and then the patter sort of sections. But once you're, once you're in that, you're, you're fine. Every, all, the, all the rehearsal and all the sort of technique that you've worked upon is, is, is normally is suffice enough to support it all. But talking about your own personal progression, obviously this every year the mm-hmm. as, as Scottish Academy, as Scottish mm-hmm. Academy, um, puts on a fabulous show. Quite often the Sun Time in the mm-hmm. last couple of years, or they, I think they did Iron Curtain about four years ago, which mm-hmm. I was so marvellous. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's always two sort of uh, newer works as well in, mm-hmm. in the sort of ensemble for the envelope of music. Yeah, the, for the uh, new musicals and development. Are you involved in either of those this year? No, I'm not. It, uh, this year it's Active Virgin and Towards the Moon. Uh, I'm I, seeing Active Virgin, I think tomorrow. Tomorrow. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not involved with them. It's actually my two friends that are they're the other MDs that are on the course that are that are leading those. Uh, but they're they're very very good, they're very very. And good. is this your last year with the academy? Yes, I have. it's only it's only a one year. It started in September and ended in September. So it's your first so. year as well, then. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Pretty so much. what now for you? Uh, well. I work on God's good grace. In all honesty, yeah. I, we're, I'm going down to I London. Don't know that piece. Who that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going down to London in September Jolly to good. do a showcase at the Criterion Piccadilly Circus, really? and then it's just contacts, work, yeah. work, work, basically. That's that's where I'm where I'm headed. I've got a few things in the pipeline, but obviously I don't want to jinx that. No, just no, 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 no. But we we, we we shall see how how things progress. Well, I wish you every success with mm-hmm. your future career. I hope yeah. this isn't the last time we meet. Final question then. Mm-hmm. What would you take away from Stephen Sondheim's company yourself when, when you close the book on your conducting for the last time for this particular production? Probably the great fear that I could become Bobby. <laughs> that, <laughs> oh, really? that's, that's it. I've never, obviously, when you do a show, you research it and you read the play and read the book and just research things about it. And that's my biggest fear. That's, in all honesty, it's, it's getting to that point in life. And now I totally understand the midlife crisis. Totally You're a little it. young for that. But no, <laughs> no, no, when your hair goes, when that's when you need to worry. When, when you go in, when, when you research and you go into things, and you just become, become surrounded by the material, Some, something struck home that it's, this is life. It is from truth, isn't mm-hmm. it? It, it is. absolutely is, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was single at 35. <laughs> I'm still single now, by the way, so I'm still, li- I'm still living still the dream. Still living the bachelor's dream. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you mm-hmm. very much indeed. Not a problem, a thank real you. pleasure speaking to you. Mm-hmm. Musical talk. And there we are, just a random selection of interviews from the musical talk archives of the last 15 years about the legend of musical theatre, Stephen Sondheim, who died recently. Join us again for our next episode, when we'll be having more archive recordings talking about the great man's work as part of our ongoing tribute to one of the most important people in musical theatre in the last 100 years. Goodbye. This tribute episode of Musical Talk, edited and presented by Thos Ribbits. Copyright Musical Talk 2021. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our website, www.musicaltalk.co.uk or subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can, at MusicalTalkThos.